And I call Adelian Campbell to speak to and move motion 1313 for up to 12 minutes, please. Thank you, President Officer. Uh, this week, more than 1,400 people travelling from 47 countries will attend the 2018 Social Enterprise World Forum here in Edinburgh. Delegates will have the opportunity to hear from pioneering social entrepreneurs, take part in debates and benefit from masterclasses. Now celebrating its 10th anniversary, many will already know that the Forum is itself a product of Scotland. In 2008, with the support of the Scottish Government and its enterprise agencies, CEIS, a social enterprise in Glasgow, delivered the inaugural event in, Gla in Edinburgh sorry, in 2008. And for the subsequent 10 years, this Scottish export has toured the world, with cities competing for the opportunity to play host. From Johannesburg to Hong Kong, more than 7,500 social entrepreneurs and supporters have attended to date, contributing knowledge and passion to this global movement. And since that first event back in 2008, Scotland has secured the reputation as a world-leading social enterprise nation. And this time last year, my predecessor, and Angela Constance, travelled to New Zealand to participate in the formal handover ceremony, confirming Edinburgh as 2018 host. And by doing so, she confirmed Scotland as the only country to host the World Forum twice. And I sincerely pay tribute to Angela Constance for her dedication to this sector. Presiding officer, we should be very proud our country has taken such a lead and is viewed to be in the lead of the global movement of social enterprise. And while this week's gathering is of countries separated by many miles, what unites them and each and every social enterprise is the determination to do good, to put something back into community and society and is motivated by a belief in the ability to positively transform. The chance to celebrate the 10th anniversary of the Social Enterprise World Forum provides an opportunity to reflect on the growth of social enterprise here in Scotland over that decade. But while we contribute to a, a debate recognising the 10th anniversary of the World Forum, Scotland's association with socially responsible business is much longer. From New Lanark in the 19th century within my own constituency of Clydesdale to the cooperative and community business movements of the 1970s and right up to the present day where over the last decade the Scottish Government and this Parliament across all parties have continued to champion social enterprise, working with the sector to put in place a comprehensive ecosystem of support. Incubators, accelerators, free business advice, 16 local social enterprise networks, leadership programmes and social investment are all on offer for aspiring social entrepreneurs. Whether you're starting a cafe supporting refugees or a fitness gym providing mental health support. The Scottish Government knows the power of social enterprise as a tool to tackle inequality and promote inclusive economic growth. But it's not just that social enterprise empowers communities, it's also incredibly good for the economy too. This sector contributes 2 billion gross value added each year and employs around 80,000 people. And that inclusive economic growth that social enterprises demonstrate is why in December 2016, the Scottish Government launched Scotland's first ever dedicated social enterprise strategy. Fully co-produced with the sector and set over 10 years, it sets out three strategic priorities of stimulating more social entrepreneurship, developing stronger organisations, and realising market opportunities. And since the launch of the strategy in December 2016 that's, and its accompanying action plan in April last year, we've invested more than £7 million to realise these ambitions, including more than £2 million in the Social Entrepreneurs Fund, providing advice and seed capital to more than 160 startups, £660,000 to Social Enterprise Academy to get social enterprise learning into every primary and secondary school in Scotland, reaching more than 300 schools to date. Two million pounds to provide free business support through Just Enterprise, with more than 1,800 social enterprise leaders benefiting. 270,000 to Community Share Scotland, providing innovative way to, for communities to raise the funding they need, supporting projects like Govan Hill Baths and the Rockfield Centre. 200,000 pounds to Big Issue Invest to deliver its Power Up Scotland programme, providing corporate mentoring and investment to 13 social enterprises over the next two years. 
more than £100,000 to the Council of Ethnic Minority Voluntary, Voluntary or Sector Organisation, and that will support more social enterprises like Radiant and Brighter, which I vis vis visited last month, an employability social enterprise supporting migrant communities in Glasgow, and more than £400,000 to Partnership for Procurement, providing technical support to those interested in forming consortia to bid for large contracts. And the sector continues to grow. The Scottish Government is committed to conducting a census of social enterprise in Scotland every two years. And in September last year, the results of the second census were announced. There are now over 5,000 social enterprises in Scotland, a growth of almost 10% since 2015. 64% of them are led by women, like Hay Girls, recently chosen to deliver the Scottish Government's initiative to provide free sanitary products to school pupils and students. 79% are selling directly to the public, like Brugouda, a social enterprise craft beer with the profits going to tackle water poverty in Malawi. And rural Scotland now accounts for 37% of Scotland's social enterprises, despite being home to 18% of the nation's population, with the highest densities of social enterprise to be found in the Highlands and Islands. And 70% are led by and accountable to people in particular communities like Mull and Iona Community Trust, set up by residents with a focus on sustainable development, which recently celebrated its 20th year. The sector is also growing its reach internationally too. 7% trade internationally, with the Social Enterprise Academy now operating in 12 different countries. Presiding officer, Scotland has a great deal to celebrate, which is now also seeing local authorities develop their own strategic approaches and only last night, Glasgow City Council launched its own local social enterprise strategy, developed in partnership with Glasgow's social enterprise network. But with so much happening across Scotland, and given the vibrancy of this sector, it's vital that this story is properly captured, understood and shared for the benefit of all. I will do in a second, and that's why I'm delighted to announce the Scottish Government will provide £90,000 to the Eunice Centre for Social Business and Health at Glasgow Caledonian University, named in honour of the Nobel Peace Laureate Mohammed Yunus, to help establish Scotland's social enterprise collections. And this work will build on existing materials held by the University in honour of John Pearce and an influential figure in Scotland's community enterprise eh, movement. Dean Lockhart. Uh, thank you very much. I just wanted to uh, follow up on the point about the role of local authorities and how they can promote uh, social enterprise because at the Economy Committee recently we heard from key stakeholders that they think the Scottish Government and local authorities could do more with procurement policy uh, in terms of awarding more public sector contracts to social enterprises in their local areas. Would you care to give us your views on that uh, concern? Yeah, absolutely, and I read the... Thank Aileen you. Campbell, and, may and I remind people, I'll speak through the chair, please. I know I have a bugbear about that, but no, that's I, the way it is. <laughs> Aileen Campbell. <please. laughs> um, thank you, presiding officer, and I'm, I'm well uh, aware of the members' uh, particular interest in social enterprise, and I read with interest the recommendations that the committee um, put forward, and absolutely, you know, where there are more efforts that we can put into ensuring that social enterprise can uh, benefit from procurement, then absolutely we must uh, seek uh, to do so. And I'll continue to engage with the, the member and the uh, committee on, on that issue. But going back to the announcement of that money to, um, um, to provide support to Glasgow Caledonia University, uh, this funding will not only establish the world's first dedicated archive for social enterprise, it will also generate new digital resources and a travelling exhibition to reach out across Scotland. Because it's imperative that more communities find out about and are supported to use social enterprise as a tool for transformati transformative change. I think it's also important, given the historic associ association that Scotland has with socially responsible business, that we tell that story uh, and preserve it for the future. And again, you know, look to make that we ensure that we can seek out uh, future opportunities as well. So, presiding officer, returning to this week's forum, this forum brings not only a huge opportunity for Scotland's social enterprises to raise their profile, it's also a chance to access supply chains. And I'm delighted at least 60% of spending related to the World Forum will go to other social enterprise and third sector suppliers. From catering to, to translation, the organisers believe this will be the highest ever amount of spend going to social enterprises from any major event in the world. 
But the spotlight on social enterprise doesn't end with the closing ceremony of the forum. In November, the winners of the Social Enterprise Award Scotland will be announced. And this year, there are seven categories, including the coveted Social Enterprise of the Year Award, which was secured last year by the Grass Market Community Project. And Chris Martin, Managing Director of Calendar Youth Hostel and winner of the Social Enterprise Champion in 2017 Award, has continued to advocate on behalf of the sector. And as a result of this effort, I'm delighted to confirm that this evening, Calendar will be announced as Scotland's first social enterprise town as part of the Social Enterprise Places programme delivered by Social Enterprise UK. So in conclusion, uh, Presiding Officer, Scotland is viewed around the world as a leader in social enterprise. We have a strong historical roots to build on, combined with a rich, varied and diverse social enterprise sector that is contributing significantly to the socio-economic well-being of our country. But we know that there continues to be challenges and areas where we can continue to improve. And that is why it is right that we continue to support the sector and make those improvements through our 10-year strategic plan. We must also, I don't think, be complacent. And if we want to continue to lead the world in terms of nurturing our social enterprises, we must be agile and open to new ideas and new opportunities. Again, underlining the point that uh, um, Dean uh, Lockhart made earlier on in his intervention. So I'm incredibly privileged to have social enterprise in my new portfolio because they capture the essence that all, of all that is good in our country and our communities. They believe in our communities, they recognise the resilience of our communities and they reflect the assets and the strength of our communities. And I'm sincerely looking forward to engaging with members on this issue through this debate and also through the new cross-party group that will see Tom Arthur, MSP, I think, as its new convener. So, presiding officer, I look forward to contributing contributions this afternoon and move the motion in my name. I now call Dean Lockhart to speak to and move amendment 1313.1. Uh, seven minutes please Mr Lockhart. Thank you very much Deputy Presiding Officer. Uh, we very much welcome this debate on social enterprise and the well-deserved recognition of the Social Enterprise World Forum taking place across Scotland this week. Let me add uh, my congratulations to Community Enterprise in Scotland and to everyone else involved in supporting this event, which, as the Cabinet Secretary highlighted, will attract more than uh, 1,400 people uh, from across the world. Since the first Social Enterprise World Forum back in 2008, social enterprises around the world have transformed lives, revitalised communities and have helped tackle some major economic issues. And Scotland has been at the forefront of these developments. Uh, we've heard that there are today over 5,000 social enterprises in Scotland playing an increasingly important role in our changing economy and contributing in ways that commercial enterprises do not. They play a unique role in economic, social and community development. They often save the public purse, for example, by helping to reduce reoffending rates through employing individuals who sometimes are passed over by the commercial sector. The sector is female-led, more than 60% of social enterprises are led by women, and social enterprises reach across all parts of Scotland, cities, towns, and villages. And uh, I would add my congratulations to the town of Callender, uh, which is in my region, which has been named Scotland's first social enterprise place in recognition of it being a hotspot of social enterprise activity, with organizations such as Callender Youth Project Trust, Callender Community Hydro, being great examples of the impact uh, they can make in the local community. The latest uh, social enterprise census provides an encouraging picture. More than 110,000 people employed by social enterprises across Scotland. And this debate, I think, gives us the opportunity to look at how we can build on that success. And our amendment to the government motion today referred to recent evidence given to the Economy Committee by leading stakeholders in the sector, because this evidence highlighted some of the key opportunities and challenges facing the sector going ahead. And I think we need to address them to ensure that Scotland uh, has an ongoing leadership role to play uh, in the future. I would like to highlight three of the issues uh, highlighted uh, in the committee by the uh, stakeholders. First is the issue of financial and business support available to the sector. Nora Senior, chair of the strategic board, gave the following evidence. Social enterprises are currently on the cusp. They do not fall under a single criterion for investment. Some of them really struggle to get the investment they need to grow. It would be helpful if there was a mechanism to address this. The committee heard further evidence that there is a cluttered landscape of financial and business support for the development of social enterprise. 
grants, project funding and other finance are available from a long list of different agencies with different objectives and outcomes attached to the funding streams. So this is hindering the sector's development. And this is not just a question of financial support. Social enterprise needs business support. It's often difficult for a new social enterprise to get help with business planning or setting up an office or hiring staff. So this is an area I would encourage the Cabinet Secretary uh, to take forward. Uh, we need to ensure government policy for enterprise development across the commercial sector and the social enterprise sectors are better aligned and that support is better coordinated across government agencies. Uh, the Scottish Government's Enterprise and Skills Review, published in June last year, was, I think, a bit of a missed opportunity to do this, and I would welcome the Cabinet Secretary's thoughts on how these issues can be addressed in the future. Uh, another issue, as I mentioned earlier, was the role of public procurement of contract, an important issue highlighted uh, by uh, 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 stakeholders at the committee. We heard that public procurement policy should be used more effectively to promote social enterprises in local authority areas. The public sector in Scotland spends around 11 billion a year in the public procurement of goods and services. But figures published last week show that the number of Scottish businesses winning work from the local authority has halved over the last decade. From over 50,000 in 2008, just under 30,000 local suppliers uh, were successful in local tenders last year. That's a real concern. It means we are missing the potential to support local businesses and communities, including social enterprises. Recent changes to EU procurement law means that the Scottish Government and local authorities do have the legal framework. They do have the powers to make a difference here and promote, further promote the level of public procurement to social enterprises, especially those that are supported businesses uh, and to get them further involved in public sector contracts. Again, I look forward to the Cabinet Secretary addressing this issue perhaps in her closing remarks. Another important uh, concern raised with the committee was the, the lack of clarity of government policy on social enterprise and the question of how government agencies define whether or not an organization is actually a social enterprise. It's a pretty fundamental uh, uh, concern raised by a number of uh, uh, witnesses. One witness told the committee there is a concern about uncertainty around the definition of social enterprise given the possibility of commercial organizations suggesting that they are social enterprises when in fact they're not. As we know, there is no legal definition in Scotland of what is a social enterprise. The social enterprise code is a helpful guide for what best practice is, but it is not definitive. As a result, a number of people are confused as to how they should arrange their business affairs, how they should uh, incorporate their company or business in order to qualify as a social enterprise. Another witness told the committee, I could not understand how to make the business model work to become a social enterprise. Again, this is another area I think uh, the Cabinet Secretary should take forward so that there's further clarity on what constitutes a social enterprise uh, in Scotland. Presiding officer, let me conclude by repeating our strong support for the uh, social enterprise sector in Scotland and wishing the Social Enterprise World Forum every success. I have outlined some constructive challenges that I think need to be addressed going forward. These were raised by the key stakeholders in the sector themselves so that the social enterprise sector in Scotland has the very strong foundations for ongoing future success. I move the amendment in my name. I call Monica Lennon to speak to and move Amendment 13813.26 minutes, please, Ms Lennon. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And I'd like to also welcome the Cabinet Secretary to her new post and to thank Angela Constance for her service in this area previously. And I'd like to thank the Cabinet Secretary for lodging this important debate because I think we're all delighted that the Social uh, Enterprise World Forum is taking place here in Edinburgh and that we're hosting delegates from right across the world. And I hope that visitors to our capital city have a wonderful experience this week. We're all agreed that Scotland is lucky to be home to a host of dynamic and important social enterprises that play a, a role in all our communities, often doing life changing work. And I look forward to hearing more of these positive examples throughout the debate. For our part, the, the Labour Party has a proud history of being a champion for social enterprise. It was a Scottish Labour government that 17 years ago created Social Investment Scotland. This was designed to be a vehicle for improved financial access 
for the social enterprise sector and it is still going strong today making loans to the sector to enable them to grow. Since its inception in 2001, Social Investment Scotland has invested over £56 million to 270 organisations across Scotland. This has undoubtedly been positive for the sector, however we believe that more must now be done to improve the availability and sustainability of financing. The Labour Party has strong links with the cooperative movement, another positive model for an inclusive economy. Scottish Labour aims to double the size of the cooperative sector in the UK and in our industrial strategy we talk about um, placing cooperative development Scotland on a statutory footing. We've heard in the debate already there is certainly economic return on investment. Um, there are 5,600 social enterprises in Scotland employing 80,000 people and that sense, census that the Cabinet Secretary referred to showed that the net worth of social enterprises is an incredible £5 billion pounds, uh, or £2 billion gross value added. Uh, and I think it is important to note that 72% of all employees in that sector are paid the real living wage and that 64% are led by women. I think that is uh, a good uh, note. Um, positive social impact is, of course, the other crucial important return on investment. Social enterprises demonstrate a hugely valuable and ethical way of working and show what can be achieved by setting up an organisation that is motivated by a social or environmental mission rather than profit. These organisations can make a huge difference to people's lives, in particular vulnerable people. And increasingly they are depended upon as austerity strips back our public services. Um, touching on housing, for example, when I had a, a catch up with Shelter Scotland last week, they talked about the fact that someone in Scotland becomes homeless every 18 minutes. So it's invaluable that social enterprises like The Big Issue exist to help people get back on their feet. And they have 92,000 people working as vendors um, since their creation uh, back in 1991. Um, and I th also think that social enterprises can play a role in um, regenerating our, our high streets. In my area, uh, in Hamilton, Swaddle is a social enterprise set up by local mums, for local mums. It's a vibrant shop. Uh, there's a range of events that take place there from storytelling, sing-along sessions, um, and mum-led support groups. And it's a great place to go in and buy um, baby clothing and books and, and nice things like that. The sector has a strong history of coming up with creative solutions to social challenges. Through my Members' Bill to End Period Poverty, I've seen firsthand social enterprises responding creatively to the issue in the UK and beyond. For example, I met with Barat from Sanitary, um, a social enterprise founded here in Edinburgh to promote sustainable um, and stigma-free access to period products uh, for women and girls in the Bind district in India. And I was pleased the Cabinet Secretary uh, mentioned the East Lothian-based social enterprise, Hey Girls, in her opening remarks, um, because their buy one, give one model really is helping uh, girls from a low income uh, right across the, the UK. Um, so it's good to hear that Hey Girls will be involved in the, the, the provision of the, the Scottish Government's uh, scheme on free period products. Um, and obviously I hope that universal access to period products will soon follow with my proposed Members' Bill to end period poverty. Um, presiding Officer, in conclusion, um, I'd like to pay tribute to social enterprises in Scotland from their contribution to the Scottish economy to the role they play in all of our communities here in Scotland and beyond. It is clear to, to us that there is an opportunity for well-resourced local authorities and social enterprises to work together to advance their common purpose of making Scotland a better place to live. Uh, for all of these reasons, we will support the Scottish Government's motion tonight and the amendment in Dean Lockhart's name, because we also welcome the recommendations in the Economy, Jobs and Fair Work Committee's report and agree there is a need to ensure that social enterprises are better able to access financial and other support from government agencies. Um, but it's because of the, the increased pressure um, on their services in this age of continued austerity that Scottish Labour is seeking to add uh, to the, the motion uh, simply that in the current climate of austerity, so, so social enterprises have taken on an even more significant role by filling gaps left by cuts to the welfare system and pressure on public services. Uh, so for that reason, I therefore move the amendment in my name. 
call Patrick Harvey. Six minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And uh, as other members have, can I welcome Aileen Campbell to her new role in government, congratulate her on her appointment. Uh, and Greens, uh, I hope, like all other parties, will indeed be voting for the motion and the amendments uh, at decision time. In debating social enterprise, um, I'm going to indulge myself with a, a little bit of uh, nostalgia uh, in the first instance, because my own first role in the social enterprise sector, uh, I probably would have been maybe 10 years old or thereabouts when my mum and some pals decided uh, that they weren't willing to wait around for government to finally get around to doing something about the issue of recycling, and they were going to set up their own project. Uh, and waste management, recycling, zero waste approaches is one area where social enterprise and community activism organized through social enterprises really has led the way. Before government at any level was really doing anything about this issue, communities took the initiative themselves with a borrowed van uh, and sometimes uh, roping in their, their kids, as I was roped in, to hurl bundles of newspaper around on a Saturday morning. It felt like a lot of fun at the time. What led to, what was, what was led to, what, what got through that whole process was the development of a really, really significant sector, uh, developing innovative approaches to resource use, to zero waste policies, uh, and eventually uh, local and national government recognized that they had a responsibility to and stepped up to, to that because of the community leadership uh, that happened. Uh, later, uh, after coming back from, uh, from university and slightly falling on hard times, had to go back and live with my mum and dad. And she said, yes, of course you can come back and live here, my mother said. There'll always be a place for you. And you'll go out to work on my new furniture recycling project. Because that initiative, that community drive was still there. Uh, and a, th a theme that ran through both of those projects was the, the need to place real value on resources, not just those physical resources that could be diverted from landfill, but the human resources, the value of the human beings uh, whose effort, whose creativity, and whose talent was not being used by the private sector. Many people far from the labor market, but social enterprises finding ways of bringing them back to not only productive work, but a relationship with one another and a relationship with the community around them. And that's something that social enterprise remains fantastically creative at. And I see from the World Forum's program that that attitude to resource management uh, and to zero waste approaches still remains a fundamentally important part of the social enterprise movement. It still requires intervention from government, of course. And as we've seen just recently, uh, uh, back in, uh, in, in Dumbarton, bad news with green light recycling. Uh, and I'm not sure it's a, a declarable interest formally, but yes, my mother's been a director of that recycling project as well uh, since its inception. And to see that project uh, failing, sadly, it's, it's not only the decline in the demand and therefore the price of the recyclates, that's not the only problem that project encountered, but it set the fundamental context. And so government intervention is necessary if we're going to make sure that social enterprises like that have the economic context in which they can work effectively and in which they can deliver their services in a sustainable way. Because it's pretty clear that a free market approach fails to achieve that social and environmental return from those projects and also fails to achieve that high, inclusive, and diverse employment approach that social enterprises so often do. It's been said quite correctly that social enterprise means different things to different people. The term is an umbrella term, it's a catch-all term. For some people, it's a bit of a, a nice-to-have, optional extra to the economy, something akin to philanthropy. For others, it's a revenue-generating source uh, to pay for essentially charitable work. But I think most fundamentally, and Greens believe strongly, that along with cooperatives and mutuals and community ownership, social enterprise in its broadest sense should be seen as a better, a fundamentally superior basis for our whole 
economy. If we look at the characteristics of social enterprises, the, the kind of things which members across the chamber will recognize in, in their own communities, we see organizations that recognize diversity in their employment practices and amongst their service users, a diverse needs of the people they engage with. We see organizations with our, which have a higher than average commitment to paying the living wage and to have low wage differentials, not taking extreme high pay for the managers, but actually recognizing that they have a, a, a responsibility to create a more equal economy. We see organizations that have a, a respect for their responsibility for the whole impact of their economic activity. Essentially, uh, an economy driven by values rather than the desire to extract ever more private profit. A social economy is what we should be aiming for because the alternative to that, presiding officer, is to continue to tolerate the anti-social economy that we currently have today. So I hope the Scottish Government will commit to ensuring that its resources and all forms of business support services uh, for the private sector aren't only open to social enterprise, but positively incentivize businesses to adopt social enterprise models. Willie Rennie, six minutes, please. Uh, thank you, Deputy President Officer. I too welcome the Minister to her position and the contribution that she's made this afternoon. I also welcome the Congress and the delegates who are attending the Congress uh, this week. It's the fact that the Congress exists, I think, is a it should be uh, heartening for us to, to know that people across the globe are trying to enhance the social enterprise network. But the fact that it's important to Scotland, that it's here too, shows that it is important to this country as well. So I welcome the delegates to the conference and I hope they have a, a fruitful week. Um, the sector is growing up 10%. Some of those are in uh, my constituency in, in North East Fife. Uh, Castle Furniture, which has been there since 1993, has a, a great combination of providing local household goods um, to local people from disadvantaged families, but also providing employment and training opportunities uh, for local people as well. It's a, that's the secret of its success, I believe, is able to provide that local employment training as well as local goods for local people. Um, Dunshelt um, Community Shop is probably the newest one on the scene. Um, it's uh, got £100,000 from the land fund, and £30,000 they've managed to raise locally from local people, 200 local people, and their endeavour is to reopen the village shop. A tiny little village just outside Ochtermachty, and it's endeavouring to try and reopen the shop which was closed uh, last year. Um, they've engaged in a big battle trying to make that happen, and I wish them all the success in doing so. And then the, another project at the other end of the scale is up in Tayport in North East Fife, right up by Dundee. They've raised a whopping £2.8 million to develop a sports, arts and craft business as well as employment and training facility. And they're going to try and take advantage of the V&A, which is opening uh, this, uh, later on this week, by providing a, a camper van and camping site, which will be the closest one uh, to the V&A. And I would encourage people to go and um, spend a weekend there when, they, when the site opens up, but also to take advantage of the Sea Eagles which are often seen off Tents Muir just round the corner. But that just gives you a flavour, wide flavour, of the, the kind of spectrum of social enterprises that exist, that it's growing, that it's a buoyant sector. But we shouldn't pretend that it's all easy, because actually the census gives us some quite cold, stark numbers as well. I mean, 40-odd percent of the total numbers of social enterprises are housing associations. I think housing associations are good institutions, but it's, it's not what you would first imagine social enterprises to be, and perhaps it doesn't really reflect the wide diversity we'd like the sector to have. 57% of social enterprises are small. 34% are 10 years or less. But the fact that 41% were turned a loss in the last year should be a great cause for concern. There's quite a turnover in the sector, some of them make it, find it quite difficult to make the finances work. And since part of this is to try and make them financially independent, that should be a cause for concern, which is why I was pleased to see that the minister um, is confirming that the £1.2 million for Just Enterprise and the whole growth startup recovery part of the support mechanism is going to continue and they're going to review it 
within the next year as well, which I think would be welcome, because this is an area that requires support. Uh, my wife previously worked for a couple of social enterprises. Um, both of them subsequently closed down. One of them was a book recycling project um, in Cowdenbeath. Another one was a paint recycling project in, in Glenrothes. Both of them didn't manage to continue. Uh, both of them struggled to make the finances work and make the financial model work. So that just gives you a little bit of reflection just within Fife. The fact that some succeed, some grow, some manage to make a great success of it and others don't, even though the principle, the model that was initially established was a sound one. So we shouldn't get too carried away that we think this is a vibrant sector and it's constantly growing, although there are more in the sector. Many in the sector find it really difficult to make ends meet. So we should be working constantly to try and find the, the financial support and mechanisms that are in place to make them financially independent. Because it is right that we should be creating that social capital. We should be trying to boost the environment, but we also are about financial independence. It's about a new model of business. It shouldn't constantly have to require uh, government to step in to support it. We need to have that financial independence uh, to make them succeed. And if you go to the other end of the scale, it's quite astonishing what some of the, the big social enterprises have really managed to achieve. Two I'd like to pick out. One is Cafe Direct, based in South Shields, that is a really quite an innovative um, scheme that actually ploughs 50% back of its profits back into the coffee growing communities where they buy their products from. And in fact, those communities, they own 50% of the shares of the company, an international social enterprise providing a good fair trade, environmentally sustainable uh, product for customers back here. A great example of a thriving social enterprise, but then al also the big issue, which has already uh, been mentioned. Established since 1991, 92,000 vendors over that time benefiting to the tune of £115 million. Pounds. That's a hugely successful social enterprise. And what I'd like to see is that the social enterprises we've got in Dunshelt and Cooper and also in Tayport manage to perhaps one day to achieve the dizzy heights of Café Direct and the big issue. Thank you. We move now to the open debate and it's speeches of six minutes, please. Can I remind all members who wish to speak to press the request to speak buttons? And I call Bruce Crawford to be followed by Gordon Winters. Uh, thank you, President Lewis. I'm delighted to be able to participate in this very important debate this afternoon. I think it's true to say that my constituency, like others, there are so many fantastic social enterprises it would be an impossible job to name all of the ones which we've, which we've had an association with and which we've come to admire. I hope, there, therefore, that those who don't get a name check today will understand why I've decided to tell the story of just one very special small town in my constituency, and that is Calendar. As the Cabinet Secretary outlined in her opening speech, Calendar has just won the fantastic national accolade of becoming Scotland's first ent uh, social enterprise town. This accreditation recognises as Dean Lockhart rightly said, what an incredible hotspot for social enterprise activity that Callender has become since I was first elected to the Scottish Parliament in 1999. Callender is the largest settlement in the Loch Lomond and Trossachs National Park, a predominantly tourist town on the edge of the Highlands, whose resilient community have for more than 20 years used social enterprise to tackle local issues. So let me take you on a whistle-stop tour, President Officer, of Calendar to tell their story of why it's received this well-deserved recognition. And let me start with the Hydro Calendar Community Hydro Scheme built by Calendar Community Development Trust through their subsidiary Calendar Community Hydro Limited, commissioned in October 2014 and now generating to the national grid. Calendar Community Hydro is Scotland's first community-owned hydro renewable project. It was it's the first on ground owned by the Forestry Commission and the scheme that donates its profits to the Trust, which has now funded already over 40 local projects since March 2016. Uh, a substantial income is expected to be generated from its activities, I understand, up to 2.85 million over the next 20 years. The next stop in the tour is to the remarkable 
steam ship Sir Walter Scott, the oldest surviving screw-driven steam ship in regular passenger service in the United Kingdom. Now, who ever thought they would know that this afternoon? It's been operating in Loch Katrin for more than 100 years, owned and run by a charitable trust as part of a wider visit attraction that won the award for the best visitor attraction in Forth Valley last year. Now, coming back down the road into Calendar itself, we stop off at the McLaren Leisure Centre, which is a community-led organisation operating extensive sports and leisure facilities. And McLaren High School Pupils Next Door make significant use of the centre through a dual-use model. Now, not far down the road, we come to Bridgend and we come to the remarkable Calendar Youth Project Trust. This trust runs a five-star calendar hostel, which has welcomed over 20,000 overnight guests and trained more than 18 young people in hospitality since it first opened in 2014 and has created 40 local jobs in the area. They're in a cafe and events package and have recently branched out into we weddings packages. The trust also used the hostel as a base for a wide range of other youth activities. And as Chris Martin from the trust said recently, Calendar Hostel is a prime example of how a business can be set up in such a way as to generate income, but also to make a significant social impact in our community. Over the years, Calendar Youth Project Trust has made a huge difference to the life chances of young people in the area to develop their local talent and encouraging entrepreneurship. So next on the tour, presiding officer, we arrive at the beautiful Brackland Falls. When a storm washed away the bridge at the popular falls, Calendar Community Development Trust set about raising funds and setting up a partnership to replace it. It's now developed into a unique go-to destination for visitors. That same trust, rightly disturbed by the rising number of empty shops in the town, brought together a group of artists and crafters in a cooperative that is now the independent company Creative in Calendar. Creative in Calendar is run by volunteers and has been central to the regeneration of an empty shop on the main street and offers local artists the chance to display and sell their art. Now, of course, to make any town successful, you need the right homes for people to live in. And through the work of Rural Stirling Housing Association, we're about to see their offer expanded significantly with the development of new homes. These are just a few of the huge number of community groups and social enterprises that exist who've responded to the social and economic challenges of living in calendar by using the social enterprise model. These groups range from the community newspaper, the Ben Lady View, I'm sure the presiding officer has read it, through to the community cinema established by the Calendar Film Society. Calendar is a beautiful little town with beautiful big ideas. It has shown us what is possible when communities come together to take on local issues, make change happen, and provide an exemplar for other communities. I know Scotland is bristling with brilliant social enterprises, so it's an outstanding achievement for this fantastic small town being be, to have been named the country's first social enterprise place. And I heartily congratulate all involved for their dedication and commitment to calendar. And I look forward to welcoming the Cabinet Secretary in her new role to calendar this evening when we celebrate this remarkable accolade. Thank you very much. I was just thinking maybe you could put on a bus, Mr Crawford. <laughs> and I call Gordon Lindhurst to be followed by James <clears throat> Kelly. Deputy Presiding Officer, it gives me great pleasure as a Lothian MSP to welcome the Social Enterprise World Forum to Edinburgh again. With a multitude of participants, including social enterprise leaders, policy makers, commercial partners, and young people, they are expected to make the trip to our country, which is seen by many of them as a world leader in this field. We should be proud of what we have achieved in Scotland, but as the government's own social enterprise strategy recognizes, there's still much more we can do if social enterprise is to fully become part of mainstream society and business. If I might begin by highlighting an example that shows the immense value that social enterprise already holds in our society. The Economy, Jobs and Fair Work Committee 
recently completed a report into Scotland's economic performance, and my colleague Dean Lockhart has already touched on that. During one evidence session, Johnny Kinross, Chief Executive of the Grass Market Community Project here in Edinburgh, and with which I am myself familiar, talked about individuals who are, in his words, not wanted by the commercial or even public sectors, and said of the people they have helped, and I quote, you will never get a more loyal member of staff or anyone who is more grateful for a job. I've had people in my office telling me that they would do anything for the grass market. It is a hugely privileged position to have someone in your office saying that about you. That is because, in their view, you have literally saved them. You saved their life. And I end the quote. These emotive words give us insight into how entrepreneurship can deliver improved social outcomes. And during my time as an MSP, I've seen firsthand that social enterprise comes in all shapes and sizes. Tiferet Campbell Community is based in Edinburgh Pentlands in my region, and it offers residential care and a variety of day services to people with learning disabilities and autism. Their social enterprise projects, including making and delivering compost and firewood, give people with additional support needs a route into employment. And for Tiferous customers, the product holds that added value, which is more than just about price, quality, or availability. The social enterprise strategy notes the greater appetite that the Scottish public now have for these social products, it goes on to hint at a social certification scheme to increase awareness, developed further in the action plan of last year. Um, given that the evidence to our committee called for this very initiative earlier in the year, I would be grateful if the Cabinet Secretary could provide us with an update on this. Other social enterprises help people in different ways, often stepping in because everyone else has left. The motto of Castle Community Bank is banking, with a, sorry, banking but with a community spirit. Indeed, as the major banks seem to take flight from the high street, credit unions and community banks are stepping in to see whether they can provide a viable alternative. Castle have been looking at the possibility of doing this in parts of Edinburgh, such as Juniper Green and Leith, and their willingness to step in in this way has been a comfort to those who have felt abandoned. These are just a few examples of the social and community benefits that can be delivered through such entrepreneurship. And as we celebrate these successes, there's still a lot more that can be done by social enterprises themselves, their commercial partners, and importantly, by government. Evidence we heard in the Economy Committee was around a frustration about government tendering processes and recognizing social value. Social enterprises have spoken about competing with traditional commercial businesses who perhaps don't place as much emphasis on social benefit as they do. And they feel that it's also forgotten in the procurement process. If social enterprises are to survive and compete, there must be a way for them not only to showcase the value that they bring, but for them to be able to do so easily. After all, Many are small, with 43% of them generating an income of under £50,000. So a flexible and holistic Scottish model of impact measurement would be welcome. And as we celebrate what is going on in Scotland, we should help social enterprises that want to expand further afield to do so. Because with the international reputation we have, there is an interest elsewhere for us to go further. As the government strategy recognizes, social enterprises should be able to access high quality export advice. So again, I wonder if the cabinet se secretary can tell us about this and whether last week's announcement of an export partnership drive with the CBI will include room for successful Scottish social enterprises to work within the scheme to help similar entrepreneurs to do the same. Deputy presiding officer, let me conclude by in particular, thanking those who work in our social enterprise sector and to wish them well for the week ahead. James Kelly to be followed by John Mason. Thank you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer. And like other speakers, can I 
congratulate Aileen Campbell on her promotion to the Scottish Cabinet and wish her well in her uh, new post. Um, many of the speakers have highlighted the, the benefits of uh, social enterprises. A lot of people, a lot of members uh, talking about practical examples in their own constituency and some also talking about the statistics that uh, back up the benefits of social enterprises, the, the fact that there are 5,600 in Scotland, they employ over 80,000 people and generate a £5 billion pounds contribution uh, to the Scottish economy. And of course, uh, all those things are important, but I very much agree with the points that Patrick Harvey was making about social enterprises when he said that essentially it's a, a different approach that uh, social enterprises come forward with. It's a more ethical approach. Uh, there's not the same focus on the profit and loss account or the balance sheet. Um, there tends to be a more collective approach amongst the people who run the social enterprises and use the social enterprises. And that, and th and that therefore leads uh, to more ethical trading conditions and also better conditions to work in as was witnessed by Monica Lennon quoting the fact that 72% of the enterprises pay the living wage and also that 64% uh, were led by women. So clearly they are, uh, you know, they're, they're trailblazers in areas that we would want to be best practice in the Scottish economy. I also think that uh, they play an important role in, you know, and taking on many of the challenges that we've got uh, in communities throughout Scotland. So we have, you know, a growing elderly population, which is good that people are able to live older. Um, but with that, you know, comes challenges. Some, some elderly people, particularly if their partner passes away, you know, can have a, a, an issue with loneliness. And if they're able to participate in a social enterprise or a social enterprise is able to interact in terms of providing a service, then that, that's very important for those, those elderly people. Also in terms of social exclusion, um, you know, it, it remains a challenge in some communities where there's a lot of deprivation, that people uh, are not included in traditional employment opportunities and social uh, enterprises are better at, at reaching out to that uh, and ensuring that you know, people get their chances. Uh, it's also fair to say that there's been uh, more pressure on public service budgets in recent years. Uh, there have been cuts and that has left a shortfall and a gap. But social, social enterprises uh, have been good at uh, filling. Um, I think in terms of, you know, my region is a, a Glasgow uh, MSP. Locally, there are, there are many good examples of social enterprise. And I know Patrick Harvey's got a uh, a members debate on this issue coming up tomorrow night. Um, in Rutherglen, the Healthy and Happy, which are a, a local charity, have a couple of social enterprise uh, initiatives. Um, one is the Cam Glen Bike Town, um, which is great at promoting uh, cycling and participation in cycling, something which is really important. We had a good members debate last week on the European Championships and spoke about the importance of big building on the legacy of that. I think organisations like the Cam Glen Bike Town can provide a, a lot of support to that uh, by encouraging people to cycle. Not only that, but promoting uh, greater infrastructure for cycling and also helping people with uh, the repair and maintenance of their, their bikes. Um, Healthy and Happy also have the, the, the number 18 social enterprise facility uh, which is at a former church in Rutherglen and which is used as a community facility uh, for many groups in the area, including Cam Glen Radio, which uh, I was honoured to, to be able to visit uh, just, uh, just last Friday there. The other point I would make in this uh, discussion is that I think there has to be more use made of cooperatives, and I do declare an interest as a member of the Cooperative Party. Uh, I'm convener of the cross-party group in cooperatives and we recently had uh, a good discussion about uh, housing co-ops um, led by Whitleburn uh, Housing Cooperative at the uh, last meeting and 
Uh, again, Monica Lennon uh, you know, mentioned some of the challenges that there are uh, around housing. Um, West Point Woburn Housing Co-op have been a shining example in terms of addressing some of those challenges in that uh, local area. Uh, however, there's not been any housing co-ops established in Scotland for 15 years. So I think we're missing a trick, uh, both in, uh, in terms of housing, but generally in co-ops and not promoting them uh, uh, enough. So I would like to see the Scottish Government make cooperatives and cooperative development Scotland more central uh, to their uh, economic and, and social strategy. Um, so in summing up, uh, I want to agree with everyone else in terms of uh, support and social enterprises, but I do want to emphasise that uh, we need to bring co-ops more into the Scottish Government's economic strategy, and I would be interested to hear the Minister's view, uh, Cabinet Secretary's views on that in summing up. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr Kelly. I call John Mason. Ms. Ed, John Mason. Mr Mason, please. Uh, thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. I think I was looking back. I last spoke in a debate on social enterprise in February 2017, uh, and since then, I think we'd all agree that the sector has developed, although there have been some of the issues and challenges which people have mentioned today, uh, including raising public understanding of social enterprises, uh, probably continue. I understand, as others also have said, that there's no legal definition of a social enterprise, but there is a pretty clear voluntary code with certain criteria, uh, values and behaviour, the key ones being that a social enterprise must be selling goods or services, profits must not be distributed, and they should be managed in an accountable and transparent way. If we leave aside housing associations, which certainly in my mind are a kind of distinct sector, as I think Willie Rennie was suggesting, eh, one of the largest Scot eh, social enterprises in Scotland eh, would be the Wise Group, which I think eh, many will have heard of, and which is based in my constituency in the East End of Glasgow. And they are involved in a range of areas, including community justice, helping people coming out of prison, getting into work, supporting people looking for employment, eh, energy, advice and support. And from their 2017 accounts, we see that their turnover was £13.7 million and their average number of employees was 236. So while many social enterprises are quite small and local, and that is a really good thing, we can see that it is also possible to have large and national social enterprises. And that makes me think there is potential to have more of them on a larger scale uh, and, for example, the WISE Group actually operates beyond Scotland in the northeast of England as well. Ownership is an issue which has been mentioned uh, already, and clearly there are a variety of ownership models for organisations. And these ownership models, it seems to me, are inextricably linked to the purpose of the organisation. Now, sometimes on the Economy Committee and maybe in Parliament as a whole, we focus mainly on what a business is actually producing. Is it pr building nuclear submarines? Is it involved in renewables? Is it in tourism or the hospitality sectors? And perhaps we don't concentrate so much on the ownership model and what that is, and related to that ownership model, what is the motive and purpose of the organization? Because I do believe that ownership tends to drive the purpose of an organization, and in most cases, a private company or a listed company will be aiming first and foremost at maximizing profit. They may, they may well have other aims as well, maybe a good supplier, a good customer, a good employer. But if the profit is going entirely to one owner or a group of owners or to a wider range of institutional shareholders, that is bound to affect the way the organization behaves. However, there are clearly other models of ownership, which perhaps both public and we in the Parliament give less attention to. Uh, for example, employee ownership is one model and a cooperative, as Mr Kelly has been saying, is another model. Now, a social enterprise is not a specific model of ownership, but like a charity, any profits will be reinvested uh, and not distributed. And that means it would still not want to run at a loss, but the incentive to make profits at all costs is reduced. And motivation is important for an, organ any, an organization too. I think it was Brian Souter who said in relation to the bus sector that it was difficult to get a public service ethos into a private bus company. So ownership is important and affects how an organization is seen, both by those inside and outside of that organization. 
The fact that an organization is not run for profit or purely for profit, I believe, does change the perception of staff, of customers, and of the wider public. Now, the document, Scotland's Social Enterprise Strategy 2016 to 26, makes some very interesting reading two years after its publication. And I particularly wanted to focus on some of the things it says on pages 11 and 12, where it talks about future influences and trends. And some of these were and are both opportunities and, I think, challenges. To take just a few of them, one is under the political and legislation side. There is uh, opportunities under early learning and childcare. That sector is clearly developing and has many opportunities. But perhaps still that sector, we have uncertainty about how much will be public sector provision, how much will be private sector provision, and how much might fall under social enterprise. Under public services, there's the suggestion of more preventative services. And I have to say, I think maybe that is something that has moved more slowly, and the jury is still out as to where we're going on that. Because, of course, of the fact that we have to disinvest in reactive services if we're going to invest more in preventative services. And therefore, perhaps the social enterprise sector has not been able to develop as much in that area as it was hoped. Demographic change is also mentioned, an aging and changing population, eh, and I do think there are opportunities. But the challenge is, if you take a large area like a council area, providing guaranteed care services, and my mother is a recipient of these in South Lanarkshire, if you take a, a, a larger population like that, it is a challenge. And you can see why local authorities might be more inclined to provide through their own larger in-house provision rather than trying to deal with a number of smaller social enterprises. These are the kind of challenges I think we need to face. Ethical consumption is also mentioned, and definitely there's an opportunity. But it's harder for people in a limited income who are virtually forced to buy the cheapest product as all that they can afford to also be looking at the, some of the ethical issues round about that. And also a rebalanced economy. It said in the paper, the continuing long-term priority of achieving a more balanced economy is driving a broader and more diverse business base. This implies a growing need to foster social entrepreneurship, increase the rate of social enterprise formation, and encourage more diverse forms of business ownership. Now, are we making progress on that? I'm not sure. I totally agree that we need a more balanced economy and a broader, more diverse business base. But I have to confess, in practice, when I go for a coffee to meet someone in Glasgow, it's just very easy to go to Cafe Nero or Costa rather than making the effort to go to one run by a social enterprise. So I think we have some distance to go on a number of these points, and we need to keep this under review. What else we can do in Parliament and in committees like the Economy Committee in supporting and encouraging social enterprise? Yeah, I have a feeling I'm running out of time, so I think I'd better... We have some time in hand, so I'm being do generous. Well, if I can just Mr. mention Mason. one other thing, that would be the Glasgow Social Enterprise Network, which has been established uh, mainly during 2017 and is now incorporated as a company limited by guarantee, uh, and I believe is leading the way uh, specifically in social enterprise in the Glasgow third sector interface. Uh, they talk about some of the things they've been doing, like facilitating space for members, a platform to form partnerships, uh, and other great things. So in conclusion, I do very much welcome the forum coming to Edinburgh. I wish them well, and I'm sure they will be considering some of these issues in the coming days. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Mason. I call Jamie Halker-Johnson to be followed by Tom Arthur. Mr. Halker-Johnson, please. Thank you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer. Uh, can I join other members in uh, welcoming the Social Enterprise World Forum to uh, Edinburgh after 10 years? This week's forum will be a truly collaborative event with a range of sponsors from the world of business and enterprise, as well as local organisations like the University of Edinburgh. It's also positive to see the support from the partner organisations, the British Council, Community in, uh, Enterprise in Scotland, the Scottish Government, and Social Enterprise UK. It has undoubtedly been, uh, been a successful decade for social enterprise in Scotland. As MSPs, we've seen many uh, become established in our communities over those years, no doubt across every region represented here in Parliament. Other Scottish social enterprises like Social Bite have ga uh, gained an international reputation and more are looking towards uh, exporting beyond our borders. Social enterprises have a significant role to play in our economy, as well as working towards socially conscious ends and responsible business practices. In many cases, people can see directly the benefits that accrue from well-run social enterprises, re reinvesting profits from their services back into communities and other projects. We've also heard previously about the opportunities presented in terms of building productivity, skills development, and of course, employment. 
And I'm pleased to look at so many social enterprises in my area and see the possibilities that they have created in employment particularly. And as Dean Lockhart and uh, Monica Lennon both said, many are led by women, rather more than in conventional businesses. Others have provided fantastic new opportunities to people with disabilities. In my own region, the Highlands and Islands accounts for an, an enormous proportion of Scotland's social enterprise landscape. As we know, the Highlands and Islands enterprise area accounts for just 9% of Scotland's population, but contains with it, within it some 22% of Scotland's social enterprises. These organizations have thrived in rural, uh, rural communities, but most especially in those that are remote. Again, the social enterprise census illustrates this well, showing that 34% of Scotland's enterprises, social enterprises are found in rural areas. Thinking again on my region, this is quite evident. In many cases, social enterprises are created by necessity. Sometimes it's in response to a service uh, provided by a local business was being lost. Sometimes it's about providing the sort of services that are taken for granted in the central belt. And on other occasions, it's response to a public service being withdrawn with local people coming together to take over the reins. In many cases, though, we see social enterprises finding a gap in a marketplace and offering something new. COPE in Shetland has for some years built up an excellent social enterprise for local people, while also providing employment and skills development for people with learning difficulties or on the autism spectrum disorders. It's also an organization that has shown significant growth. And I hope that this will strike a chord with the minister um, having her, uh, as her colleague uh, Jamie Hepburn recently visited COPE, um, and I don't believe I'm overemphasizing his comments and saying that he was clearly impressed by what he saw in Shetland. I hope that he'll be able... Yes, of course. Cabinet Secretary. In uh, the summer months, I had a, a real privilege of seeing some of the work that COPE do through the Shetland soap, and uh, equally, like my colleague Jamie Hepburn, was equally impressed by the real uh, work uh, and commitment and passion and the impact that they are having th uh, in Shetland. Mr. Harker Jones. Thank you very much for that intervention. I certainly agree with you, and I hope um, I hope that you and um, uh, the, the, the minister will uh, help spread some of the lessons that you learned from um, places like uh, Shetland and the good practice that uh, they do. Uh, in addition, other social enterprises in my region act to preserve local heritage and boost their local area by providing visitor attractions. In 2004, when I was a young candidate just starting out in this uh, politics game, I visited Nakando Woolen Mill uh, in Murray, which at the time was an entry in the BBC's Restoration series. It was a place steeped in over 200 years of history, but which was in a st poor state of repair and struggling to survive. In 2014, it reopened, and now Nakanda has both a history and a future, saved by those who worked hard and recognized the important, importance of our rural past. And others have grown uh, to become indispensable parts of their communities, promoting mental health, tackling addiction, giving ex-offenders a second chance. I visited uh, Bly Trust in Orkney last summer and learned about the fantastic work they do in supporting those they work with, providing opportunities within their catering and gardening social enterprises. And as a member of the Economy Committee, we had the opportunity to explore some of the work of social enterprises during our recent inquiry into Scotland's economic performance, as others have mentioned today. But to get a better grasp of the status of social enterprises in Scotland, we do need better information. The social enterprise census is a starting point, but much of the information about the performance of social enterprises is impossible to find. In many cases, some of the issues that surround social enterprises also overlap with other small businesses. For many who may consider establishing a social enterprise, they, do not, they don't feel that they have the skills and knowledge to do so. My party has tried to address this by outlining the need for the promotion of social enterprises and indeed business, businesses generally within education, inspiring a new generation of entrepreneurs. We also know well the challenges that small local businesses can face in accesses, accessing public sector procurement, again, as has been mentioned earlier. We can also have a look at the many successes where they are supported to do so, both at national level and locally. Because at its core, diversity within our economy is undoubtedly positive. Social enterprises particularly can adapt to local change. They can reflect local circumstances and priorities by being grounded in a particular community. They can even bring together communities as local people become involved and their organizations become more visible. Many have led in ethical and environmentally sensitive business models too. So it's positive to see Scotland as a significant destination of interest for social enterprise and to be bringing so many from around the globe to engage in this year's World Forum. Even a quick glance at the program will show that it is a truly international event, but one plenty of opportunity to share experiences, network and to discuss the next steps for their enterprises. I wish them every success for the week ahead. 
Thank you very much. I call Tom Arthur to be followed by Daniel Johnson. Mr Arthur, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. It's a genuine pleasure to have an opportunity to speak in this afternoon's debate. And I would like to begin by um, welcoming Aileen Campbell to her new position and congratulating on, um, her on her, her appointment and also to pay tribute to Angela Constance uh, for her work in previous position and who has been such a fantastic champion for equalities issues and I'm sure will continue to be so um, on the back benches. Uh, one of the great joys of debating social enterprises is it's an opportunity to hear about the various social enterprises across Scotland. And indeed, we're having this debate because we're celebrating social enterprises from across the entire globe. And it's uh, a real honour for Scotland, but a, a well-earned one that the World Forum is coming home after 10 years. Just looking at the uh, statistics, 1,400 delegates from across the world. That really is testament to the size and to the scale and to the energy and to the dynamism of the global social enterprise movement. But before talking about that, I want to bring things a bit closer to home to my constituency of Renfrewshire South to be specific and just to touch on a few of the fantastic social enterprises that operate there because they really give a fantastic example of the transformative impact that social enterprises can have in their communities. Take, for example, the Newston Development Trust established some years ago, originally as a project to take ownership of a, a former bank, which is now a thriving community cafe, um, one of which I'm very pleased to host my subjects in too, I will add. Based in the cafe is also the Newson Nup Lemur Community First Responders, a group that I've spoken about previously in this parliament. This gives an excellent example of the partnership working which can exist between social enterprises and other groups. Also present in the bank cafe is a cycle repair initiative this is a, uh, playing an invaluable role in promoting active travel within Nielsen and the wider East Renfrewshire area. Um, and I've had the, the privilege of meeting some of the individuals who work there. Um, last year, I had the opportunity to meet an individual who had recently started a training uh, programme there, aiming for his um, city and guilds. And he was an individual who had come from quite a difficult background. He had been in and out of the criminal justice system and had perhaps to some extent lost hope and the opportunity to gain a set of skills, working, learning cycle maintenance was absolutely transformative for him, giving him a real sense of pride and a sense of ambition. And rather than thinking on the past and what might have been, he was talking about the future. So that's just one very small example of the incredible impact that social enterprises can have, not just in the communities, but for the individuals who work for social enterprises as well. I could not talk about Newson Development Trust and not mention the windfall that they received, and I use that term advisedly, from their sale of their um, street stake in the Newston Wind Farm, which generated £2 million for them. That is now a substantial sum of money that they have at their disposal, and I've been pleased to have conversations with Newston Development Trust, who I know will be looking to use that windfall to maximise um, opportunities for other groups and, indeed, individuals within the Newston and wider area. I also want to touch upon Local Energy Action Plan, who are based in Loch Winnock and also operate in Bridge of Weir and my colleague Derek Mackay's constituency. They do a range of excellent work promoting energy and environmental efficiencies. Uh, for example, they have a car club, they provide advice and support, they're involved in food sustainability, and I'm looking forward to working with them as we move into the winter months to provide information and support for my constituents to ensure that they can stay warm this winter, but in a way that doesn't break the piggy bank, so to speak. I'd also want to go and highlight active communities. Now, they're a, originally a Paisley-based organisation, and I know my colleague George Adam is speaking later, so I'm sure we'll hear plenty about Paisley-based organisations, but they also operate within Johnston as well. I want to just highlight a project that they're currently involved in, which is to seek to take over the form of Johnston Police Station. They have recently been awarded £10,000 from the Renfrewshire Council Community Empowerment Fund, and I want to really pay tribute to my um, SNP colleague, Councillor Ian Nicholson, who's the leader of Renfisher Council, and the administration for the energy and drive they have shown in engaging with social enterprises and community groups across Renfrewshire and indeed in my Renfrewshire South constituency. Active Community started 15 years ago as a jogging and walking group. It's now expanded into a range of other areas with more than 700 people participating every single week and their projects and vision for what I hope will be the successful um, acquisition of the John former Johnson Police Station are really impressive, including setting up of a men's shed and also to be a, provide a permanent base for Kairos, which is a new and inclusive women's initiative that they are pioneering, which is led and developed by local women, which provides drop-in sessions and personal development courses. 
Just um, as I move on to my conclusion, presiding officer, I just want to pick up a few remarks that were made by other members and indeed contained in um, one or two of the opposition amendments. I think Monica Lenz's amendment in speaking about filling the gap made a very, very important point. There is a gap to be filled as a consequence of austerity and given the um, nature of this debate, I don't want to engage in political point scoring, but there is challenges that we face which can, simply cannot be met by the state or local government in these times, and social enterprises pay an invaluable role. Along with many other people in society, for example, are unpaid carers, they really are the unsung heroes, and so many services simply could not be delivered without their effort and energy. Um, I finally want to highlight a remark, not in the chamber at the moment, but that Patrick Harvey made, which was that... Uh, speaking to social enterprises as a model for the wider economy and he spoke of an economy driven by values and i think this reflects something that uh, duncan fort from social enterprise scotland stated in a, in a recent blog he said in terms of struggling to almost define social enterprises which has been a theme of this debate but duncan fort stated ultimately it's about building a new kind of economy where everyone is included and where everyone can prosper we want to drive forward wealth creation ethical business practice and fair workplaces. I think in times and perhaps in many of our debates we can look at wealth creation or fair work or ethical business practices as existing in silos and being independent and separate from each other but in social enterprises we see them all working together and we see the benefit they bring. So I think those social enterprises will continue to deliver for our local communities. We provide a model for the kind of economy we can aspire to be in the future. And I just wish to conclude by wishing all the delegates to the forum the very best for a successful week. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Arthur. And I call Daniel Johnson to be followed by George Adam. Mr. Johnson, please. Thank you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer. I'd like to begin just by drawing members' uh, attention to my register of interest. I'm a company director of a business with retail interest in Edinburgh. But that's also why I'm very pleased to speak in this debate. And indeed, I think in some ways I want to follow on from the remarks that Tom Arthur just made, because I think that this is an opportunity not just to reflect on social enterprises themselves, but to reflect on the changing face of business and the, the very real role that I think social enterprise has played in that changing role. Now, Deputy Presiding Officer, I'm an unapologetic child of the 80s. And when you say business to me, even as someone who's worked in business, I can't help but think of images of the film Wall Street and Gordon Gecko, red braces and business driven by asset stripping and profiteering off the, the job losses of downtrodden workers. And indeed, I, I think that, 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 that there is much in, in business which is un, unpalatable. But I think it is also something that has uh, changed and very remarkably so in recent years. When I think about my working life, as uh, somebody who started work uh, at the, the beginning of this millennium or just before it, we went, have gone from a situation where business sort of saw social responsibility as something that they kind of had to do. It was something they tucked at the end of their annual report to some, what we see today. And I go to meetings of the CBI and other business organizations, and they recognize that diversity is core to what they do. That social responsibility isn't just something they add on to their business, but is actually core to the way that they run their businesses and that their businesses are better for doing so. And for me, I think it's uh, not a coincidence that it's through this period of time we've also seen you know, the, the hugely important role of social enterprise. And while some people uh, in the chamber this afternoon have questioned the, whether there's a need for a definition, I think it is difficult to define social enterprise. They're very diverse. But at their core, I think there are three critical elements. One is that they are unashamedly commercial. They do seek to run a business and, and develop a profit. But critically, as that profit is reinvested along the lines of both their wider social aims and indeed their core purposes. And indeed, it's where I'd, I maybe slight, take slight issue with what John Mason was saying, that it's profit itself is not the problem. It's what that profit is used for. And I think that is very true for social enterprise, but actually it's true for the wider uh, private business as well, because good business reinvests its profit both in its productive capacity and in, in its workers. And that's critical. And that's, I think, the, the example that social enterprise can provide. And it's why I'm also proud to be speaking in this debate, speaking from labour benches, because I think there is a, a labour case for business. We have a strong record. We have a strong record, I think, both in terms of uh, creating social investment in Scotland, as my colleague Monica, Monica Lennon pointed out, 
But I fundamentally believe that business at its best creates opportunity. It creates work and jobs. Jobs which are not just merely about earning a wage, but jobs which empower the individual. Uh, and that businesses that do so, do so by supporting, nurturing and including their workers. And I think that the change we see in modern business is that they recognise that that isn't just a good thing to do but for wider reasons, but it actually makes their businesses more productive. And especially as I think we move towards a knowledge economy, I think that becomes critical. The only way you can be a productive business in the knowledge economy is if you include your workers, you empower your workers, you reinvest. The old model of asset stripping business, profiteering business, business that seeks to extract profit for private good, I think is simply uh, bust and, and, and belongs to the past. So Gordon Gecko may not be gone, but we are, I think, in a period of change. So the one question I would pose is whether or not we are right to treat social enterprise as such a different category of business. I think what is of critical importance is that as the government looks at its policy of supporting social enterprise, that it does so in an integrated way across its enterprise policy. And so I'd very much support the comments to that end that other members have made. Now, it would be entirely remiss of me uh, to uh, uh, make this speech without, of course, mentioning social enterprises in my constituency. And I would just like to disagree with everyone in this chamber that it's Edinburgh Southern that is the true home of social enterprise in Scotland. And let me give you two examples of why. First of all, dig in in Brunsfield in my constituency, which is a fantastic example of the community coming together in the face of the, the loss of a local independent business to create a community greengrocer. Uh, over 200 people came together to form uh, that at their first meeting with 300 people owning shares and it's now been in existence for the last four years and very successfully so as well. Likewise, I'd like to highlight the work of the bike station and indeed, one aside, there seems to be a common thread. Uh, you know, the, the, the bicycle seems to be uh, fundamental to an awful lot of social enterprise in Scotland. I, I don't know why that is, but maybe something to look at. But it, it grew from an informal bike swap in Sheen's Primary School in my constituency, recycling bikes, teaching bicycle maintenance. Its uh, most uh, recent balanced bike project has delivered over 100 bikes to nurseries across uh, the, the Lothian region, making sure that all uh, young children uh, learn those uh, vital early habits in terms of their health and fitness. And what they have in common is investing back, as I was saying in the earlier in my contribution, into their wider aims, but also doing so in a, 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 with the, the, uh, being conscious of the wider benefits and the wider community, which I think is what is so vital with social enterprise. So finally, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer, I think it's hugely important that we recognise the importance of this conference, that it's happening in Edinburgh. I think it's, it's, it's uh, of huge benefit when Edinburgh and Scotland uh, hosts uh, discussions, that, uh, uh, whether it's about social enterprise or other initiatives. But we must also look towards the future of social enterprise, making sure that it isn't just a sticking plaster as we, uh, uh, as for, for other services in our community, as spoken to in the Labour Amendment, but likewise, I think that it, it is properly supported within the broader context of our enterprise strategy as set out in the Tory amendment, which is why I'll be supporting both of those this evening. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I call George Adam to be followed by Jeremy Balfour. Mr Balfour will be the last speaker in the open debate. Mr Adams, please. Thank you, President Officer. This debate is a perfect opportunity to celebrate the progress we have made in the last 10 years and to acknowledge all that Scotland is doing to promote social enterprise, not just home, but globally. And for me, presiding officer, it has also an opportunity to draw attention to the excellent work going on in my own constituency and wider Renfrewshire community. I say wider Renfrewshire community, presiding officer, but I actually just mean Paisley. While it is phenomenal that Scotland is recognised as a world leader in the facilitation and promotion of social enterprise, it is important for me to look past this global praise and really examine the great work going on in all our constituencies. Just last week, during the programme for government debate, I stressed the heart of everything the government is doing is dignity and respect and the drive to put people first. Drawing attention to and supporting local social enterprise does exactly that what these organisations have the ability to really make a difference within our communities to effect positive change. 
Unlike traditional businesses which focus on making profits for shareholders, the social enterprise model uses business practices to achieve socially positive goals. This could be anything from delivering youth activities to running a community hall. And I've seen the success of this firsthand in my constituency and know uh, the benefits can be life-changing for many people. In Paisley alone, the social enterprise model benefits thousands within the community and there are plenty of excellent organisations I could name as a testament to Scotland's success as a social enterprise advocate. But initially, presiding officer, I was wondering what I would actually discuss and what I would mention first. And then, when I was listening to Mr Mason's uh, contribution, I remembered that I could start with one that I'm involved with myself, which is uh, the St Martin Independent Supporters Association, a not-for-profit community trust of which I'm convener, who now own 28% of the stock of St Martin Football Club, working with Gordon Scott uh, uh, and they're on target to have a majority share of the club in eight years' time. And this is an important debate within our community and within our national sport in general, is in who ends up owning the football clubs at the end of the day. And one of the things that we found difficult during the negotiations was bear in mind that we, as a social enterprise, as a not-for-profit trust, were negotiating with an organisation that was full of business people who were purely thinking on a business basis. And that was a difficult thing for us to overcome to get to the stage. But now, luckily, we have 1,300 St Murn supporters and Paisley Buddies putting in between 12 and £25 per month. And I've all bought in to that long-term goal. And the whole idea is that managers, presiding officer in football, can, they may come and go, and a lot of them have been coming and going at St Murn Park quite a lot recently. Star players may shine brightly for a while, but it's the fans and the community at a club that will always be with the team. And there is no right or wrong way to ensure fan ownership of Scotland's football teams. And I think in this debate, there is no right or wrong way for a social enterprise to go forward as long as it sticks by its ideals and its own beliefs and what it wants to actually achieve. Uh, but it's an idea and an ideal that time has actually come. And, presiding officer, I could give another example of in my constituency where the Thomas Coates Memorial Church, a massive, massive Baptist church made by the Coates by a Cotton Barn family, uh, which now has been closed because basically the individuals, the churchgoers, could no longer sustain a building of that size. It's a cathedral-like uh, building. Now, there is a trust being set up of which I've said I would quite happily be a member in order to see is how do we find a future for this one building? How do we find a sustainable future for that building? And that is the, th the way that I can see uh, social inclusion and social uh, businesses making a difference in our communities. There's also the STAR Project in Paisley, uh, which is an award-winning organisation who are delivering sustainable and positive social outcomes since opening their doors in 1999. They employ a person-centred approach, delivery group and individual support plans, and work constantly with local and national strategies to build safer, more connected and resilient families and communities. I visited the STAR Project last year and spoke to constituents and saw for myself what this programme does and what it means to people. Organisations like the STAR Project go a long way towards tackling inequalities by helping people with everything from battling loneliness to applying for benefits. Above all, the STAR Project equips people with the connections and confidence to thrive, which in turn encourages growth throughout the community. With this in mind, it is clear that the social enterprises can directly help address the underlying causes of poverty and inequality in our communities and ensure that everyone is able to live in a fairer, healthier and happier country. Where all people are valued and able to achieve their potential, 45% of social enterprises have stated that one of their main objectives is to create employment opportunities by helping to unlock the full potential of more people furthest from the labour market. Social enterprises not only connect people with their communities, but can help harness producti productive capacity and therefore strengthen long-term economic performance. This is another excellent example of social enterprise in my constituency, which is Loud and Proud organisation run by Tommy McGrory. Loud and Proud have been reigniting Paisley's passion for music for over 10 years and during that time have helped countless students access and achieve success in the music industry while making a huge contribution to the regeneration of Paisley as a whole. Their main goal is to educate, train and prepare students for a career in either music or music technology, at the same time give others the ability to simply play and enjoy. 
It's proven time and time again how successful music is at connecting people from the far corners of our community, but too often young people face barriers and roadblocks to their dreams and aspirations. Loud and proud have been knocking down these barriers and as the results have been tenfold. While, enjoy while enjoyment is at the heart of what they do, I know Tommy equally focuses on knowledge, discipline he can pass on to his young students. The self-discipline needed for excellence in the music uh, business, like timekeeping, preparation, relying on others, being relied upon and working as a team, all valuable skills in that industry. So social enterprise, presiding officer, is the way forward, and we must do all we can to remain at the forefront of global developments in this area and make sure we remain committed to funding and supporting local organisations. They really can change people's lives and reshape whole co communities in the process, and they can regenerate our communities. Thank you very much. And I call Jeremy Balfour, who is we then move to the closing speeches. Six-minute warning has been issued. Mr Balfour. Uh, thank you, uh, Deputy uh, Presiding Officer. Um, I like um, everyone else so far. I want to um, welcome uh, this debate um, uh, and welcome the delegates uh, to Edinburgh. Uh, as we've heard, social enterprise is good for the Scottish economy. Uh, it makes a two billion economic contribution to our economy, uh, and that is something we should um, welcome and we should appreciate. But yet it has its roots often in, in, in small projects. 43% of social enterprise have an income of less than 50,000. It employs 80,000 FTE across the whole of our country. And as we've heard already, 61% of social enterprise are run uh, by women, uh, far higher than in any other sector. Uh, as well as having um, a higher proportion um, of women running it, uh, many social enterprises, as we've just heard from uh, the previous speakers, uh, seek to engage with those who are seeking to get back into employment who are struggling to do that. Whether that is older people, disabled people, those from ethnic minorities, or other um, categories within our society. And I think that is something we should welcome and encourage but I think also there becomes the challenge. Um, we have heard uh, over the last couple of hours um, very heartwarming stories of how good social enterprises have been in different communities, how they have been successful, um, how they have um, attracted uh, employment, and how they have gone from strength to strength. Uh, being the final speaker, can I be uh, Mr. Pessimistic? and say the one uh, social enterprise uh, that I was involved in through a charity that I used to be involved in uh, went belly up after six months. Uh, the reason it went belly up was not because it didn't have a good model, not because it didn't have good leadership, because obviously I was part of it, but the, the problem was that there was a tension between um, how do we attract people into employment who are difficult to place, and at the same time, make enough money to keep the social enterprise going. And I think Willie Rennie uh, made um, a, a helpful observation, but actually there are lots of social enterprises who are either running at a loss or nearly running at a loss. And I think there's a challenge there for uh, those who are seeking to set up social enterprise. But we do want to encourage people into the workplace who perhaps haven't had that opportunity, either through the, uh, the public or private sector, but how do we get these people into employment? How do we give them the training and at the same time have a model that will work and will be sustainable? And I think for those social enterprises that we've heard about today who have had success, we need to be able to, and hopefully this week here in Edinburgh, we will be able to hear of good practice and we'll be able to hear of schemes which um, have worked so that people can learn from that, see where the mistakes are, and then move on from that. But I think there is, as again previously mentioned, a role uh, for government, both here in Scotland and at Westminster, and within our local authorities. Um, I am um, delighted that we have the city deal here for Edinburgh and the South East 
of Scotland. It's going to bring in millions of pounds into the economy. We're going to see innovation hubs started in some of our universities. We're going to see the arts here in Edinburgh benefit um, because of national um, and local government coming together. But I think there needs to be a role for social enterprise in all of this. We need to make sure that we do not leave behind the more difficult communities within Lothian, within the borders, and within Fife. And I think social enterprise can be used with government targeted funding, with local authority targeted funding, to help those who are struggling to get into employment, particularly maybe those with disabilities, to give them that experience so they can learn from it. Uh, Deputy President Officer, I think this has been um, a helpful debate, um, an encouraging debate, uh, but I think there are lessons to learn and challenges ahead. Um, and I too want to wish well uh, to all those that are meeting uh, within the capital over this week and hope the lessons that they learn can be fed down to all organisations across Scotland. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And can I say I'm pleased that all members are present for closing speeches, apart from those who asked for, who requested, and have been granted leave not to be in the chamber. So there's a big plus for today. It's made my day. I now go on to the uh, closing speeches, and I call on Alec Rowley to close for Labour. Six minutes, please, Mr Rowley. Thank you, President Officer. I'm pleased to close the debate for Labour today, and we'd also like to extend a welcome to Social Enterprise World Forum as it comes to Scotland this year. I would also wish the Cabinet Secretary the very best in her new role. As James Kelly said, Scotland is an excellent choice to host this gathering as we have an array of world-class social enterprises operating throughout the country. That includes my home area of Fife. Fife Social Enterprise Network was uh, actually the first local social enterprise network to start up. The first meeting took place in 2004 at Furniture Plus in Dysart, and they continue to hold regular meetings. There are over 160 social enterprises in operation across Fife, and they have a total income in excess of £26 million. In Clarkmanninshire, Stirling, and across Mid Scotland and Fife, social enterprise play an important part in our daily life. Both Willie Rennie and Bruce Crawford highlighted some of those. As the motion notes, and as the Cabinet Secretary said, the inaugural World Forum event took place here in Edinburgh 10 years ago. So it is only fitting that the 10th anniversary of this event, one that will bring delegates from all over the world together, once again returns to Scotland. Social Enterprise Scotland has stated the purpose of the World Forum is for social enterprise leaders, practitioners and supporters from all over the world to come together to share the knowledge, build networks and discuss practical ways to build a more sustainable economy. This comes at a time when more and more people are realising that the current way our economy and society works is not fair and is not set up to deliver in the interests of the many. So this gathering is certainly something which we should welcome, celebrate and encourage more of, especially given the fact that social enterprises play such a vital role in our communities and also significantly contribute to our economy as a whole. I would also want to add to what Monica Lennon said and focus on the social good of many local social enterprises working at the community level, providing many high quality social services from care for the elderly, transport to supporting people into employment, and often the last line of defence against some of the deep rooted poverty and deprivation that exists in far too many communities across Scotland. In focusing on this area of work, I would have to say that many organisations have also felt the impact of failed austerity and cuts to the public services, but there is also, I believe, a missed opportunity to grow this sector, as John Mason uh, touched on. Community pl planning partnerships were meant to work in such a way that they brought all the key players together and focused all of the resources on achieving the outcomes set by the partnerships. 
I believe much more needs to be done to ensure the ability and effectiveness of social enterprises to reach communities and achieve the strategic policy objectives of government is recognised. On top of the economic and social importance, many social enterprises are also leading the way in creating pro progressive, fair and equal workplaces, the kind we need to see more of in Scotland. This was highlighted by Patrick Harvey. 70% of Scotland's social enterprises are led by and accountable to people in their local communities. 64% are led by women. 72% pay all employees the real living wage. And further to this, they also have a smaller wage gap between the highest and the lowest paid in their organisations, something that many of our large organisations, both in the private and public sector, could learn from. It can at times be difficult to define what a social enterprise actually is, but at its core, a social enterprise is a more ethical, dynamic and independent way to do business. As Daniel Johnson pointed out, it is a business with social objectives whose surpluses are reinvested for the purpose, uh, either in the business itself or with the community, rather than being driven to maximise return for shareholders and owners. Organisations like this have such an important role to play, especially with the current climate of ideologically driven austerity, as a number of speakers have highlighted. And it is fortunate that there are organisations out there trying their best to mitigate against some of the worst effects of the rise of austerity we have seen over these last few years. Dean Lockhart talked about the need for more investment, but this is a contradiction to his and the Scottish Tories' support for austerity. We need a rethink when it comes to Tory party and its zealous austerity agenda continuing to chip away at our public services and their ability to invest in areas like in social enterprise. Tom Arthur made the point that he did not want to make this about politics. But I say when we are debating the importance of social enterprise, it is crucial to highlight the negative, negative impact of failed Tory austerity, for you will not create a better society whilst promoting inequality through austerity, and you will not grow a dynamic community-led social enterprise approach against a backdrop of deep-rooted cuts. The speeches today all recognise the massive potential of growing this sector of our economy. We need to follow that up with resources and investment, and that means an end to austerity and recognition for the need for investment and growth right across Scotland. Thank you. And I call Michelle Ballantyne for close the Conservatives, please. Ms Ballantyne. Thank you, presiding officer. I'd like to join with my colleagues across the chamber to welcome the Social Enterprise World Forum back to Scotland and congratulate all those involved in organising and delivering the event. As we have heard, the forum enables social enterprises from across the world to share wisdom, build networks and explore how to create a more sustainable future. There is no doubt that this opportunity to share stories of success and failure can be one of the most important things in progressing a business. And though discussing those challenges they have faced and the support and skills which might have moved them forward or have moved them forward are essential in terms of their learning. But today's debate in this chamber has also given us the opportunity to share our own stories of the fantastic social enterprises around Scotland. From Bruce Crawford's detailed description of Calendar, Scotland's first social enterprise town, to Gordon Lindhurst's quotes from Johnny Kin Ross from the Grass Market Project. Now, I had the privilege to work with Johnny 10 years ago when I was involved in setting up and running a social enterprise and a charity, and Johnny came to work for us. And I know that Johnny's commitment to social enterprise is second to none. And for that reason, his words around the impact that it has, not only on the community it actually delivers to, but on the people who work for social enterprises, sits very comfortably with me, because he's absolutely right it is incredibly meaningful to people when they can get involved. And social enterprises came about in the recognition that there were organisations using the power of business to bring about social and environmental change. 
And Monica Lennon, in fact, highlighted that and highlighted the way in which social enterprises have a strong history of responding to social challenges. And that's exactly what they have been doing. What we have recognized over the last few years is their massive growth. Um, there's been a huge growth in the number of social organizations that identify as social enterprises over the last 20 or 30 years. And for that reason, I very much welcome the Cabinet Secretary's support that the Scottish Government is currently giving and is going on to give to social enterprise. Because it's not about just whether we need them. Um, and I, I'm sad that there has been a move to politicise in this debate. But it is also about whether we want them and how we want them, how we want to organise them, how we want to control them, whether they need to be regulated, how much support they actually need. Because actually, we have seen in their operation the potential to create an in increased sense of community belonging, as well as providing better access to services for those who are often marginalised in their communities. John Mason spoke very eloquently about the different models of organisations that have been around and are around, whether it's co-ops, social enterprises, or extremely well-run businesses. All of them actually play their part in supporting community benefit. And he talked about the challenge um, in how you actually create a better community and the need to upstream money to that preventative work, which is actually very difficult to do. And we have a real opportunity with social enterprises to actually facilitate that move that I know the Scottish Government originally spoke about 10 years ago, because I gave evidence to them on it. Um, and I think most of us across this chamber want to see. So if we can actually get that upstreaming of, of funding and of operations, that will actually come with a mixed economy, we absolutely should be celebrating that across all parties. Social enterprises are a vital part of democracy and governments around the globe are coming to recognize their value. And it's good to see Scotland at the forefront of this development. You know, I think we can, as the cabinet secretary said, be rightly pleased that we have a leading place in the development of, of social enterprises. But they are businesses and they do require the skills and approaches that will ensure their sustainability. And if we don't recognize that, we will get increased failure and we will get people coming in thinking it's an easy way to operate, to earn a living. It's not, it's hard. I know, I've done it, I'm still doing it. As Willie Rennie identified, 41% of social enterprises returned a loss in the last year. And that fact should raise significant alarm bells if sustainability is our watchword. Quite a lot of people talked about defining a social enterprise and the importance of that. Yes, it is important, but I agree with Daniel Johnson and others who said we should be careful when we start defining it because good businesses also lend to our social welfare. And actually, we don't want to constrain entrepreneurs and opportunity by putting too strict a process around it. However, we do need to define it well enough to make sure that they are sustainable. And I think a number of speakers actually talked about the need to actually ensure that. I think it was Gordon Lindhurst who, who sorry, apologies. Um, Gordon Lindhurst talked about the need for a flexible and holistic Scottish model of impact measurement. And that is absolutely something I think we should think about because it will help us understand what is happening and it will help us under direct our support appropriately to ensure that things are sustainable. Each and every one of us can make a contribution to this. And I must echo my colleague Dean Lockhart when he said that the Scottish Government must take seriously its role to provide a clear and structured framework for social enterprise and to allow for more certainty in the sector they do need business support, and we must get that to them. I just quickly, before I close, because I know the, the presiding officer is going to ask me to do so now, um, mention a couple of enterprises in my own area that I was very impressed with when I visited them. One of them is called the You Can Cook Project from Peeblesshire, which has actually now established an official partnership with the University of Edinburgh Business School to promote an eat healthy, live healthy lifestyle. Um, and it also promotes social enterprise to students and graduates with the aim of inspiring more students to get involved with social enterprise projects. I think these are the kind of things that we need to look for. 
And as Jamie Halco Johnson emphasised, in many cases, local people are able to see the benefits of those well-run social enterprises quickly as they are reinvested back into the community projects. And now projects. you must conclude. Um, so, in conclusion, yes. I want to just thank everybody involved in this forum. And in terms of the motions, sadly, we will be supporting the government's motion, but we won't sadly be able to support Labour's because you have politicised the language in this. And social enterprise is not a political issue. It is a community benefit issue that we're all involved with. Right, thank, thank you. you. I now call Irene Campbell to close the government. Cabinet Secretary till decision time, please. Thank you, President Officer. Uh, today's debate has been an absolute pleasure to be part of members from across uh, the country describing with a real sense of pride the social enterprises in their constituencies and regions and give a flavour of the variety and scale of work happening in villages and towns and cities across the length and breadth of Scotland. And I'm certainly looking forward to going to a uh, calendar this evening with uh, Bruce uh, Crawford. And I would just say though to um, Daniel Johnson, he said his constituency was the home of social enterprise. I'll just gently remind him that I have New Lanark in my constituency, so I'm gonna claim uh, that for, for my own. <laughs> Uh, but what is common to all these stories is that Scotland's social ent entrepreneurs are driven by a passion to improve the communities in which they live. And what is also strong is the united front this parliament has put on today, largely united front this parliament has put on today, across all the parties to come together to celebrate the achievements in Scotland of our social enterprises and the real global lead Scotland is taking. That positivity is absolutely important as Scotland welcomes the world uh, to the Social Enterprise World Forum. But it's also important as uh, some global representatives of the Social Enterprise Academy are here with us in the chamber today. And I think I understand that uh, pupils from Broughton High School are, uh, have also visited the parliament today. And I think it's important that they hear and see that it's not just this government that endeavours to support social enterprises, but a collective endeavour that is not, a, it's not owned by one political party, but a united Scottish approach that is not complacent, but still seeks uh, to grow and has actually helped transform uh, the approach for other businesses, as I think uh, Daniel Johnson mentioned in his remarks. The contributions today uh, and the contributors today have been uh, constructive, they've been insightful and they've been considered. And they're not simply about just seeking to congratulate Scotland and what we've achieved, but really think about what next for Scotland and social enterprise. What more can we do as a society to rebalance our economy, to create the fairness and inclusive growth that we all want to see? So while we are in agreement, the debate was not though without its challenge. And it's really difficult to uh, single out a particular contribution, but I really valued the words of Patrick Harvey. And he did take a bit of a nostalgic tour of his own life, uh, growing up with a very uh, active mother. I can certainly relate to that as well. I would just point out, though, that he did mention Greenlight, and I understand that PACE are working uh, uh, there as well to provide some help and support, and certainly can facilitate any more information on that matter. But Patrick Harvey, uh, I, for me, when he described social enterprise, summed it up uh, when he described the resource that they value is the creativity and the talents of people, that they are part of an economy driven by values. And again, that, that approach and that um, emphasis was uh, underlined and reiterated by Tom Arthur, uh, James Kelly and Monica Lennon that they show a potentially superior basis for economy motivated by ethical practice and localism. And so given what our communities stand to gain by looking at inclusive economic growth through the prism of social enterprise, it's absolutely right that members ask government what more we can do. So in response to some of the issues that were raised, I know Dean Lockhart uh, mentioned the uh, need to uh, declutter the landscape and we are developing a map of the social enterprise ecosystem to simplify that landscape. Uh, the new South of Scotland uh, agency is also looking to Highlands and Islands enterprise as a model approach to supporting social enterprise. And there's a knowledge and exchange programme between Scottish enterprise and just enterprise uh, uh, also, I think those were issues that were raised uh, by other members who contributed to this debate. I think uh, Dean Lockhart and Gordon Lindhurst also mentioned the issues around public procurement. And we are uh, funding Partnership for Procurement to provide free tender writing support and encourage uh, uh, that uh, work uh, to ensure that more people can get access to those public uh, uh, those, uh, those opportunities. So again, we can furnish him with more information on that. Um, 
Patrick Harvey and Willie Rennie also uh, spoke about the challenge that many social enterprises face in terms of trying to make ends meet. Again, that was a point that was raised by Jeremy Balfour. You weren't being pessimistic. It's an absolutely legitimate point to uh, make. Again, Just Enterprise gives free advice and has business recovery service. And again, we would just stress to any social enterprise that is feeling the pinch to contact Just Enterprise as early as they possibly can. We're always looking to see if uh, these things can be improved and what else in terms of support might be offered. James Kelly and Monica Lennon uh, also mentioned cooperatives. And again, the Scottish Government funds co uh, Cooperative Development Scotland to promote that model. And I agree that this should be absolutely viewed as part of that wider uh, movement uh, in our attempt to rebalance the economy. And indeed, I, I know growing up that my dad was part of East of Scotland Farmers Limited. That itself was a cooperative, and I know how important it is for that part of the world in Strathmore. And finally, I think um, people did mention the issue around definition. I, and again, I would just point to the voluntary code of practice for social enterprises in Scotland as the benchmark criteria and values for any social enterprise uh, establishing itself uh, in Scotland. Now, I want to, uh, presiding officer, conclude by bringing together the reasons why we do value our social enterprises. Alec Rowley spoke uh, passionately and rightly about the need uh, for creating a fairer economy that benefits us all inclusively. And it's about empowering our communities, about recognising that when we permit and allow our communities to have the chance to take charge, uh, to reimagine what life could be like, special things happen. And they have a reach that probably Scottish government, local government or health services just don't have. Uh, social enterprises are nimble, they're agile, they respond to community need. And so we need to uh, acknowledge this. And Alec Riley again was right to bring in uh, community planning partnerships uh, into this debate as we need to recognise uh, and we need to see a much greater recognition of what so social enterprises can do at that community planning partnership uh, level. Um, again, uh, so uh, in conclusion, presiding officer, um, I just want to uh, underline the fact that the reason we are gathered here today is to welcome the so Social Enterprise World Forum. And I think on behalf of us all, we do sincerely want to welcome the world to uh, Scotland. And on behalf of us all, I think what we want to do is to ensure that the next 10 years of social enterprise development in Scotland is equally as exciting, helps more, uh, more uh, community organisations across Scotland to develop the work that they want to in response to the community need that they, and the challenges that they face. And that together across all of those social enterprises, the variety uh, and the diversity that they bring to our communities, that we can all work to support them to create the fairer and more equal society that we all uh, seek to see. Thank you very much. And that concludes our debate on the Social Enterprise World Forum 2018. The next item of business is consideration of business motion one. 3861 in the name of Graham Day on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau, setting out a revised programme for tomorrow. Uh, I could ask if any member wishes to speak against the motion, in which case press their request to speak button, speak button now. I call on Graham Day to move the motion. Uh, move, presiding officer. Thank you. And no one's asked to speak against the motion. Therefore, the question is that motion 13861 is agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. We turn to decision time. There are three questions to be put as a result of today's business. The first question is that Amendment 1313.1, sorry, 1381.3.1 in the name of Dean Lockhart, which seeks to amend motion 13813 in the name of Aileen Campbell on the Social Enterprise World Forum 2018 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. The next question is that motion 13813.2 in the name of Monica Lennon which seeks to amend the motion in the name of Aileen Campbell be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. We'll move to division and members may cast their votes now. The result of the vote on amendment number 13813.2 in the name of Monica Lennon is yes 88, no 29.
There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore agreed. And the final question is that motion 13813 in the name of Aileen Campbell as amended on the Social Enterprise World Forum 2018 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. We'll move to a vote. Members may cast their votes now. The result of the vote on motion 13813 in the name of Aileen Campbell as amended is yes 88, no 29. There were no abstentions. The motion as amended is therefore agreed. And that concludes decision time. We'll move now to members' business in the name of Claire Baker on the Ecology Centre Kinghorn, which marks its 20th anniversary. We'll just take a few moments for members and the minister to change seats. The final item of business is members' business debate on motion 10449 in the name of Claire Baker on the Ecology Centre, Kinghorn. Marks its 20th anniversary. This debate will be concluded without any questions being put and I would ask those who wish to speak in the debate to press the request to speak buttons now, please. And I call on Claire Baker to open the debate around seven minutes, please, Ms Baker. Uh, thank you, President Officer. I am delighted to be opening the debate this evening on the 20th anniversary of the fantastic Ecology Centre at Kinghorn Lock. I would like to welcome volunteers and staff from the Ecology Centre to the gallery this evening. I know they have been working hard as well as having fun celebrating this year's landmark birthday and I hope they enjoy this evening's debate recognising the importance of their contribution. I would also like to thank MSPs from around the Chamber for supporting my motion and to be today's debate. I know that many of them will have visited the Ecology Centre and have a high regard for them, although some are unable to take part this evening. I would also like to welcome Mary Goujon to her new role as Minister and wish her well in the challenges ahead. I know that her predecessor, Rosanna Cunningham, visited the Ecology Centre earlier this year and I would invite the new Minister to visit the Ecology Centre and I am sure that after this evening's debate, she will be keen to visit and see all the work that they do for herself. The Ecology Centre has always been rooted in the local community. Over 20 years ago, a group from the local community and Craig and Colt Farm got together with the intention of developing and managing Kinghorn Lock for the local community. 20 years later, it is established as the Ecology Centre, providing many benefits for the environment, our biodiversity and local community. In many ways, the Ecology Centre reflects the development of our growing interest in environmental learning, community engagement, land ownership and management over recent years. As a charitable organisation, they have developed and expanded, continued to be responsive to developing needs and changing circumstances, and now have lots of innovative and exciting projects running alongside the delivery of their core mission. A key point for the Ecology Centre came with the successful award of funds from the Scottish Land Fund, 
enabling the Ecology Centre's recent move to the east side of Kinghorn Loch, where the new centre and grounds are situated. I would also like to thank Kinghorn Community Land Association for their briefing for the debate and recognise their role in supporting the successful move and the complementary work they do with the Ecology Centre. So the Ecology Centre's new facilities are fabulous with a modern kitchen and a bright and airy room which can be used for community lunches using produce grown on the site, for classes and learning opportunities and even wedding receptions. Being located on community-owned land has opened up so much potential for the Ecology Centre. This has expanded the number of volunteers who work on the site as well as providing employment training opportunities through Our Bright Future and Community Jobs Scotland. The volunteers are so important to the operation of the Ecology Centre from their conservation work, their contribution to growing food, to working in the kitchen and in the tool shed. They have fantastic reuse and recycle projects and make great use of their volunteers, volunteers' skills and expertise. The tool shed is a fantastic initiative that is growing from strength to strength. The tool shed is part of the Men's Shed initiative and offers opportunities to share interests, be social and contribute to the community. There are three refurbishing workshops held each week where donated and discarded tools are refurbished and then can be hired by the local community cutting down on the often unnecessary purchase of tools that can sit unused in the shed for months on end. So full training and support is given to volunteers, as well as opportunities to enhance employability and life skills. There is also a weekly dementia-friendly tool shed. It is increasingly recognised that people with early stage dementia need greater inclusion in our society, and activities which recognise the abilities they possess and the contribution they can make. The part of the tool shed that I love is the refurbishing of old Singer sewing machines. Many of us have inherited these, but they might not be working or they might no longer be needed. The tool shed will refurbish them and often send them to Malawi to support startup businesses, particularly supporting women's empowerment and financial security. This link with international development demonstrates the breadth of projects that the Ecology Centre has been involved in. The volunteers are vital to the running of the site and while they often work hard there is always a sense of a social gathering with lunch, tea and coffee and plenty of biscuits to keep the energy levels up. The Ecology Centre plays an important role in the development of environmental education and outdoor learning with growing partnerships with Fife Schools, Burnt Island Primary School, Pathhead, Picoddy and Warout Primary School have all recently visited. They focus on raising attainment through outdoor learning. The site is fully accessible to the public and provides an attractive community landscape for walking, exploring and relaxing. It is a haven for wildlife and a well-managed area of biodiversity. Alongside their regular activities, they also run a number of courses and activities throughout the year. And Saturday was the Ecology Centre's 20th Summer Festival and it was a fantastic day for everyone who went along. The sun was shining, which was a bonus. And there were live music, games, stalls, cake and lots of positive conversations about how we can improve and enjoy our local environment. In recognition of the significance of 2018 and the achievements of the Ecology Centre over this time, there has been a focus on how the centre grows in the future and how it translates its inspiring message to a new generation. Back in 1998, environmental issues were still a bit niche and knowledge on the effects of climate change were fairly limited. But we have seen a lot of progress since then. Though there is still much to do if we are to show responsibility for future generations and other countries around the globe who are particularly vulnerable to the effects of climate change. The Scottish Government is intending to bring forward a climate change bill and the next few months will generate debate on what more Scotland can do. It is also about what we do as individuals and as communities, how we reduce our own environmental footprint. The Ecology Centre have been running a Follow Our Footsteps campaign to encourage behavioural change to encourage people to stop and think, do I need to drive when I can walk or take public transport? Do I need to buy when I can hire or reuse? Do I need to tumble dry when the wind is blowing? So I really wanted to hold this debate this evening because the Ecology Centre is a great example of a community-driven project with environmental objectives <coughs> right at the heart of its work, which communicates, engages and involves local people of all ages to make a positive change in their community, in Fife and out in the wider world. I wish them well in the years ahead and I am pleased to have held this evening's debate so we can all recognise their achievements. Moving on to the open debate and speeches of four minutes, please. David Torrance, followed by Alexander Stewart. Thank you, President Officer.
I would like to thank Claire Baker for bringing this motion to Parliament today and raising awareness of an invaluable contribution that the Ecology Centre in Kinghorn Fife makes to our local community. I would also like to remember, welcome members of the Centre to Parliament today as well. It is a great pleasure to be standing here today paying tribute to Ecology Centre, a centre which has become a pillar of the Kinghorn community and my constituency for 20 years. I know the area well, as long before the Ecology Centre was there, I used to train three times a week at a canoe club. At the time, Kinghorn Loch was in an extremely polluted state due to red mud, a waste product of a nearby Alcan site composed of iron oxide, which during times of heavy rain used to seep into it. The loch was effectively dead and such was not well used by the local community. All the fish and plant life had died and the only algae and canoeists such like myself thrived. I also remember the humble beginnings of the centre. For 15 years, they operated from outbuildings at a nearby Craig and Colt farm. Their acquisition of five acres of lochside land in the eastern shore of King and Loch and the construction of a new purpose-built centre is testament to the conviction and passion of the group and was a remarkable achievement. The formation of the Kinghorn Loch Users Group in the 1990s, a collection of organisations including Kinghorn Community Council, SEPA Fife Council and local clubs all worked together to ensure recovery of the loch. Fast forward to the present day and the loch is a thriving hub of activity used by a local and wider community with an abundance of wildlife and plant life following their tireless work with the Ecology Centre playing a vital part of that transformation. The centre is a prime example of a centre founded by local people for the benefit of local people and their local environment, creating local volunteer opportunities and jobs, contributing to the local economy, maintaining, enhancing and improving the local environment, and perhaps most importantly, bringing the local community together, something which is cumulatively is nothing short of an ad admirable. During a recent visit, I was particularly impressed with the ingenious upcycling ideas, my personal favourite being the refurbishment of shipping containers into workshops. The Ecology Centre has been invaluable in making environmental responsibility both understandable and accessible to all in the local community. Serving as a centre for schools to use for outdoor and acti activity learning, hosting multitudes of family-friendly events to encourage families to make most of the environment and the that surrounds them, and providing a space for volunteers to experience growing food on their own adopted patch of land, to familiarise themselves with conservation work and its associated practices or to even to do some lunchtime cooking for other volunteers and staff at the centre. One in particular unique resource that the centre provides is a tool library, where tools that have been donated, refurbished or saved from landfill can be borrowed by members of the local community, much like a book from a local library. Furthermore, once a week, the centre hosts a dementia-friendly tool shed, where those who are suffering from dementia or memory loss can come and use the tools in a safe and calm environment. Another example of how the College Centre not only promotes the preservation of the environment, but also promotes the preservation of the local community and its members. The centre also serves as a hub for many activities and workshops, including the flower ranging, tear planting, and an eco-adventure holiday club for young people. As I previously mentioned, it isn't just an amazing asset for the local environment, it's a community hub for local people, made and maintained by local people. That's what makes the Ecology Centre on King and Loch so special. They are an integral part of a jigsaw that ensured the sustainability of the area and increased engagement by the wider community. To conclude, presiding officer, I've seen the Ecology Centre go from strength to strength over the last 20 years. I once again congratulate them on reaching this milestone and wish them all the very best for the future. Alexander Stewart, followed by Alex Rowley. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I'm delighted to have the opportunity of speaking in this afternoon's debate, and I would like to pay tribute and congratulate Claire Baker on bringing this debate to the Chamber today and welcome individuals to the gallery. The Ecology Centre originally came into being through an advisory group set up by people from the local community, and its 20th anniversary, as you've heard, has now occurred, celebrating success. And the events that take place at the facility give opportunity for individuals to retrieve training, to receive education, but also to have the facility used uh, for themselves to celebrate their success from time to time as well. Situated in the hills of Alukin Kinghorn Loch, the centre is a community-based organisation and was formally established as a non-profit making charity during August 1998. The purpose of the charity was originally to develop and manage the Kinghorn Loch as a site uh, for the community to use. 
And in 2006, the decision was made to change the name of the charity to reflect its ongoing progress. They successfully purchased the land at the east of King on Loch and now houses their new centre and the ground. These are currently being developed by staff and volunteers to be used for their future growing projects, environmental education visits and outdoor volunteer days. Ultimately, the, the centre is there for biodiversity and a haven for wildlife. So all of the things that happen at this facility really engage with the community. Uh, and as I say, individuals and organisations have benefited so much from it. As the charity grew, it did so uh, in ensuring that volunteers and staff were ensuring uh, the development of the centre. And that today there is an army of volunteers who regularly attend and help many of the varied tasks. And these volunteers are the lifeblood of the organisation uh, who give of their time and give of their talents to support and ensure that the centre goes from strength to strength. I'm also encouraged to hear that they employ 11 members of staff within the organisation uh, and training takes place and they accommodate schools and college work placements because that's working once again hand in hand with the community and giving youngsters and students the opportunity to experience and engage uh, with the centre. Demands on educational visits have grown uh, and the centre now has hundreds of school children each year helping them to understand the importance of care of the environment which is vitally important within our curriculum uh, and individuals can gain from that. And one of the examples that I've seen and heard of is the, the Mini Growers Club which is a superb initiative uh, which gives the individuals, toddlers and preschool children this chance to be involved in gardening, exploring nature and enjoying various natural craft skills. Now these are vitally important as the child develops before they even get to the, the primary school. The charity has also realised heavily on the wonderful volunteers that take place and the project has many uh, little events that take place but I want to talk about the toolshed workshop which take, takes place on a weekly basis. As many know, uh, I'm heavily involved with individuals who may have had a stroke or had a brain injury uh, and individuals within this uh, complex uh, who have got memory loss or start of dementia are targeted as individuals who can benefit um, extremely from the process. Uh, and the centre gives them the chance to deal with and have the, the sessions during the week. Presiding officer, I was most encouraged to read a testimony from one of the volunteers who said that the opportunity it gave him to go to the centre and he wished it happened every day because it gave him the chance to get up and do something that he enjoyed. And his wife then said that it, she looked forward to the event too because it gave her the chance to get some much needed support for herself. Uh, while her husband was being looked after, she knew that he was being securely looked after. So, in conclusion, Deputy Presiding Officer, I'm delighted that the organisation exists in the Kingdom of Fife, and I hope very much that people will have similar ambitions across the area, because other locations, Deputy Presiding Officer, have the chance to develop this. Success be success. Congratulations to all, and the centre can be rightly proud of its achievements. Thank you. Alex Rowley, followed by Finlay Carson. Presiding officer, can I first congratulate my colleague Claire Baker for securing this debate today in recognition of the great work of the Ecology Centre at Kinghorn. I would also congratulate the Ecology Centre as it celebrates its 20th anniversary, a great achievement and one that has had many challenges along the way, as those from the Ecology Centre would, I'm sure, give testimony to. But those involved over these years have remained focused and vigilant on what they wanted to achieve and you only have to look at their website or Facebook page to see the wealth of activity they are promoting and delivering at Kinghorn Lock. I can also say that visiting the Ecology Centre is a great day out and one that I would recommend. I was delighted to see that in the celebration of their 20th year, they have launched a project called Follow Our Footsteps as they embark on a journey to do their part in the battle against climate change and to lower our carbon footprint. The Ecology Centre points out that they, when they first started out, climate change was a bit of a niche topic and they say it has come a long way since then. It certainly has. They also report that they have been inspired recently by the young people they work with and their passion and determination to find solutions to the environmental challenges we face as a country and across, across the globe. I think we can all be inspired by the work of the Ecology Centre, particularly the work with young people, but more generally as well. 
I would also want to focus on the work the centre does to raise awareness of the many environmental issues and challenges we as a country, like every country across the world, faces. Such work is groundbreaking as it reaches out into communities across Fife and further afield. Climate change, change poses one of the greatest threats for future generations, and I'm delighted that through their project, Follow Our Footsteps, the centre is going to cover new topics every month, highlighting their impact on climate change and sharing this with the wider community on their Facebook page and website, explaining how they're getting involved, what other local organisations are doing, and other top tips. We need this kind of community action to build a mass movement against the causes of climate change, where we take action ourselves, but also build the case in our country and across the globe for more government action on climate change. They do say that from little acorns grow mighty oaks, and this is why organisations like the Ecology Centre should be seen as key partners. We just had a debate in Parliament earlier today on social enterprises and their role in Scotland. I would say that this one social enterprise that has set out a clear path and agenda and deserves the support of government at every level, whether it is supporting volunteering or volunteers, working with families, with children, with schools, or supporting business opportunities and raising awareness of environmental issues, this centre is a massive success story that should be celebrated. Well done on 20 years, and here's to a good future. And the last of the open debate speakers is Finlay Carson. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Uh, having recently been appointed the Scottish Conservative spokesman on the natural environment, I'm pleased to have this early opportunity in my role to speak in the debate tonight. And I thank Claire Baker for bringing it to the chamber. As a former farmer, uh, the, envi the natural environment is a subject I've long felt passionate about, both in my time in politics and in my time growing up and working in what I consider Scotland's most beautiful constituency. And I'm quite sure the minister might uh, have something to say about that. Uh, but although uh, I'm a member who doesn't represent the, the area in question uh, in tonight's debate, I wish to echo the thoughts of others and praise all those associated with the Ecology Centre in Kinghorn for their tireless work over the last 20 years to truly serve the community. While looking into the work of the Ecology Centre, I was struck by the following sentence I found on their website that wonderfully sums up their mission. And I quote, we inspire positive change through direct connect, directly connecting people and the natural environment for the benefit of both. It truly has community at the heart of its activities, giving people opportunity to work in and to learn about the natural environment. With our ever more rapidly changing world, it's important that our future generations learn about the environment and where, and where better to do that but in the countryside on their own doorstep. The Ecology Centre brings communities together and helps develop confidence and skills that I'm sure would not have been so easily accessed locally if the Ecology Centre hadn't flourished over the last 20 years. And it's a real testament to the dedicated volunteers and supporters that that's been the case. I'm sure you're aware, as a member for Galloway and Western Fries, I've long campaigned for the region to be designated as Scotland's next national park. Uh, and it would be remiss of me not to mention the fine work on this matter carried out by my predecessor, Sir Alec Ferguson. And a national park would be a fitting legacy for a distinguished former presiding officer. And of course, a designated national park would be on a totally different scale to the Ecology Centre. But there are definitely lessons which can be learned from the success of the centre over the last two decades. If a national park is to become a reality in Galloway, then it's going to need the support of the community right from the start. And the association behind the bid has been working across the region, engaging with community groups, because it's a vital step in pressing the government for action. And when I speak to locals, I don't think getting community backing will be an issue. The Ecology Centre is showing that if you get involved in a community, if you involve a community while developing a project, then we'll, they will get behind the project and uh, encourage other people's to people to join in. Indeed, the Ecology Centre offers up apprenticeships which help our young folk gain invaluable practical knowledge as part of their course and indeed the wider working environment around them. Equally, Galloway's environment has so much to offer locals and visitors alike. 
Living in the heart of a constituency, I explore our wonderful natural nature on a regular basis and marvel at the rural economy and the, the environment I live in. I would also like to highlight the Ecology Centre's po positively uh, encouraging good conservation practice. Again, a trait which would be in line with practices in the National Park. Protected areas can help protect some of our most important and endangered species, but at the same time, and vitally, it can help encourage sustainable economic growth. It's heartening to see the Ecology Centre encouraging and continuing to take these practices forward, and it's something that we should all be thinking about when it comes to protecting our wildlife. I note that the Centre enjoyed a day of celebration on Saturday to welcome their 20th anniversary with a fun day of events for all the family. With this centre having community at its heart, I'm sure there'll be plenty more birthdays to come. And I hope my region can soon be joining them in planning similar ce celebrations. Somewhat tenuous at times, Mr. Carson. <laughs> can I now ask the minister to respond uh, to the debate you have? Around seven minutes, please, minister. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer, and it's an absolute pleasure to be able to be here tonight to respond to this debate, uh, which is my first member's debate to respond to. So I really want to thank Claire Baker for bringing forward this motion for, today, for debate today, because it really is just fantastic to hear about the impact that the Ecology Centre has had and the work that they do. And I would completely echo the sentiments of Finlay Carson there in recognising that. And I would absolutely love to take Claire Baker up on her invitation to go and visit the Ecology, set, the Ecology Centre because when I was looking through all the work that they'd done and looking more into the background of this, I, I was already thinking that. I thought this sounds like a fantastic place that I really have to go and visit. So really keen to make that happen. And you said the magic words anyway when uh, you mentioned the tea, coffee and plenty biscuits. Now having sat next to Claire Baker on the Europe Committee, this is something that we both very much enjoyed though some definitely more so than others, not looking at anyone in particular. Um, but I would also say that it was actually fascinating to hear a bit more from David Torrance, who's the constituency member as well, about the background to what that area was like before and the massive changes that we've seen as a result of the work that the Ecology Centre has done. And he talked a lot about the uh, well, local was a word that came through quite a lot in his contribution. Uh, the Centre for the Local People, it's about the local environment, the local community, local jobs and all the opportunities that that offers. And of course that helps with the wider sustainability of the area. Uh, and the Ecology Centre are a real community hub and it's, I think it's fantastic hearing about all the work that they've done. Now, we have heard so much about that impressive work throughout the debate tonight, and a lot of that, well, none of that would have happened if it hadn't been for the efforts of the local community and the residents of Craig and Culp Farm in creating the centre at Kinghorn and Fife. Now, the Ecology Centre, as we've already heard, is an inclusive community-led charity which inspires positive change through directly connecting people and the natural environment. And I'm also very glad that the Scottish Government had some role in, in supporting supporting them because in January 2014 uh, the Scottish Land Fund approved a grant of £54,901 to uh, support further development work as Claire Baker mentioned in her contribution. Now with that help the Ecology Centre was able to purchase the land at the east end of Kinghorn Loch on which now sits the new centre and grounds. So it really is fantastic that we can be here tonight to recognise and celebrate the Ecology Centre's 20th anniversary here in the Scottish Parliament because it is a true success story. Now, the Kinghorn Log site has been continuously improved and developed by staff and volunteers over the past 20 years. And as I said, we heard a lot about that from David Torrance, and it continues to do that. It's promoting biodiversity, delivering community horticulture projects, environmental education, and outdoor volunteering projects. And that's where I was really interested to hear more about the, the tool library and the tool shed that was mentioned by Claire Baker and by Alexander Stewart as well. Uh, and the fact that that's based on the men's shed model and where the tools can actually be hired by the local community themselves, as well as the dementia friendly element to that too. Other projects that they have include the music shed, a pond for the children to do pond dipping, they provide a meeting space and activities for those dealing with mental health issues, nature therapy, and classes in a whole range of skills. For example, aromatherapy, 
flower arranging, outdoor learning, uh, where the ecology centre works with around 30 schools across Fife. And another project that I was very much interested to hear about tonight, um, I think it was Alex Rowley that mentioned it, and a few other, and Claire as well, was the follow our footsteps campaign and the whole climate change element and looking at really what we can do as individuals and how we have our own impact. And that is something I feel strongly about because I do think it is for government uh, to take a lead and to make sure that we put the correct legislation in place. But there is also, we don't have to sit back and wait on that happening. There's things that the community can do, there are things that we can do as individuals to help with that process. So it's very important to highlight that. Now, education is a very strong element of the work. Environmental education has always been at the heart of the Ecology Centre. And as we heard from Alexander Stewart this evening, that demand for educational visits has continued to grow. And the centre now works with hundreds of school children each year, helping them to understand the importance of and how to care for our environment. Um, the Ecology Centre was also one of the 16 projects approved recently for the Outdoor Learning and Nature Fund. Now, earlier this summer, I actually launched that fund alongside Scottish Natural Heritage at Jupiter, Artland and Edinburgh. And the Outdoor Learning and Nature Fund is an absolutely vital project because it really aims to connect our young people from nursery age, from school age, with the environment. Because it is something that all children should be able to enjoy, regardless of their socio-economic background. Now, the Ecology Centre was awarded £27,809 for the Muddy Books project, which will see them work with three schools in Fife to embed a sustainable model of progressive outdoor learning. Again, that's something I hope I hear about uh, when I'm able to visit them. Now, when it comes to connecting people in nature, the Ecology Centre is one of the key organisations in Fife that does that. They put such a strong emphasis on creating and encouraging access to the outdoors and provide volunteering opportunities, particularly for our young people. And in terms of employment, the Ecology Centre em employs 11 members of staff, as well as providing vital employment training opportunities through Project Scotland and Community Jobs Scotland, as well as accommodating school and college placements too. And I know, as we've heard tonight, there is an army of volunteers who regularly attend the centre to help with all the many and varied tasks that they have on this site. Now, the Scottish Government supports both the environmental education work and the biodiversity con conservation work of the Ecology Centre at Kinghorn because it inspires positive change through directly connecting people and the natural environment for the benefit of both. So I really want to take this opportunity to thank those who have contributed to the debate tonight in celebrating 20 years of the centre and recognise the important work of the Ecology Centre, uh, wishing it every success. And to the Ecology Centre, I believe there's uh, members from them here in the gallery, thank you so much for all the work that you do. Congratulations on your 20 years uh, of work and please keep up the good work and I look forward to meeting you soon. That sounds like quite a place. <laughs> and that concludes the debate and I close the meeting.